Uh, Steve, sorry, don't, Steve, sorry. Steve, not, not quite yet. Oh, sorry, I thought this come down, sorry. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the Adult Learning uh, Conference. Uh, apologies for the slightly delayed start this morning. Just um, can you believe it? Some traffic problems. Um, but uh, uh, firstly, uh, welcome and thank you for coming this morning. Uh, such an early start for our conference. I'm really grateful for everyone attending. There's about 150 people who will be taking part across the various platforms uh, this morning. So, really grateful for all of our um, participants, uh, particularly our speakers and to receive from the agenda, we, we literally do have speakers from across the world this morning. So hopefully it's going to be uh, an interesting conference. Um, uh, we decided to focus this year on uh, learning for well-being. Given the, uh, given the pandemic, we wanted to really focus on something which is something which learners are talking to us about, about their mental health and their well-being. We want to, to, to really showcase the, 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 the work that adult learning can do in supporting people at this difficult time. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we start to say the event has been recorded on YouTube. Um, for those of you, most of you watching on Slido, if you want to post questions, um, you can do so in the chat and those questions will be, will be moderated and asked by the uh, chairs of the various um, panels uh, throughout the day. Um, just a reminder to all our speakers who are on Zoom, if they're not speaking, uh, please put yourselves on mute and turn your cameras off. Um, and also you'll hopefully see uh, in your agendas that there are a series of workshops, um, two workshops following the conference. There's about an hour's break in between the main plenary and the conference uh, and, the, and the workshops rather, and you can sign up to those. You'll see the links will be in the briefings, but they'll also be posted in the chat a little bit later on uh, today. Um, just before we introduce our first speaker, um, I wanted to sort of to say a couple of words really about um, some very sad news uh, the adult learning community in Wales uh, heard um, just, just uh, over a week ago. And that was the passing of uh, the former chair of NIA's Cymru, Hal Francis, uh, former uh, MP, a historian, uh, but a lifelong activist for um, adult learning. Um, I just wanted to sort of just to comment really on, on Hal's contribution, just to say what, what, a, what a huge role he played in establishing NIA's Cymru, particularly after devolution, and really establishing our identity as an organisation. We will be um, looking to work with other organisations that he was involved in to, to help mark um, his contribution um, after the family funeral has taken place, but over the next sort of couple of months, working with other organisations, just to, just, to, just to do a short uh, event to mark his contribution. But I didn't want to let, let that pass today and just say all our thoughts uh, with his many friends and with his family at a really difficult time. Um, Okay, I'm really pleased, though, to introduce our first speaker um, this morning. Um, it's one of our, um, Rubiana Norfolk, one of our 2019, I think I've got the date right, um, Inspire Award winners. <laughs> um, it's, it's a remarkable story. It, it, was, it, was, it was a brilliant story at the time, uh, but actually I think the story and the journey rihanna has been on in the last kind of year or so um, is even more remarkable, really, and just where, where she's gone. So I, I'm not going to tell too much about Rhiannon's story, because I'll leave that to her, but um just very, very pleased to welcome you and to open the conference as our first speaker, Rihanna. Oh, Diochan Vaur, David. Hello, Bob. Pan Casey the Govin, Idod, Isharad, and the Moravia Dai, Esi the Enishle Goba de Chayani, Roth Kafle, I Edrechanol, Dros Erigain Mi Stuetha. So when I was asked to come and talk about my experiences since winning the Starting Out Award in 2019, it's been an opportunity to have a look back over the last 20 months. And I think where I was when I won that award, I was eight, back, eight months back into learning Welsh after having been away for 13 years and having felt that I'd failed at learning Welsh. I'd tried and I'd not got anywhere and I'd not really understood it and it hadn't felt like it had come together, but I'd managed to take that step back into learning and it was coming along a lot better this time and that had given me really good feeling of actually now I set a, a baseline in the past and now I'm going to build up on it 
so I was just about to sit my Silva in the foundation level exam. I'd been off long term sick after having had a breakdown and I'd go on to have my contract terminated because of long term ill health. And Welsh had brought opportunities for me. Daeth Cymraeg a chafloedd mawr mawr iawn i fi. It helped me keep my brain working while I was off sick. It was a social opportunity, an opportunity to make friends and, and get to know people because I'd moved to the area and then come off sick quite quickly. So I didn't really know people in the area. So it was a brilliant opportunity. It gave me feelings of achievement that I was making progress, moving forwards, despite what was going on in other areas of my life. And it gave me some structure to my week. I knew where my lesson was and that helped me again, while off sick, you lose some of that. So it really gave me such wonderful opportunities. And moving forwards after the awards, the next year I added in some additional Welsh classes. I started a jewellery making and silversmithing course at Llanover Hall in Cardiff, as well as doing day courses in photography and crafts with veil courses. All of the while, while these things helped me work on my health. And then COVID came along. And COVID has changed all of our stories. My COVID, where do you know it, Estreon Igid. And lockdown brought those the feelings of isolation, courses closed. And if they were happening, they were happening mostly online. And I know how much effort has gone into making those things happen online in a very short space of time. And on behalf of learners in Wales, adult learners, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to everyone who was involved in making that happen because it was a huge ask and the things that happened were just absolutely amazing. So thank you. And it has been a really difficult period, but for the sake of my mental health, I've had to think of some of the positives that have come out of it. So there's been all sorts of opportunities that have come up that maybe it wouldn't have come up without COVID. So for example, things like conferences and um, lectures and that sort of thing have been online, which has actually made them far more accessible. For example, things like the Hay Literature Festival, Hay on Why. There were things that I wanted to go to, which I was able to do because they were online that I'd have never been able to do if it had happened in the flesh. I wouldn't have been able to repeatedly travel up to Hay on several different days for these different lectures. So that was a, a wonderful opportunity and that sparked interest in all sorts of different things. And it, I, I went to things that maybe I wouldn't have gone to otherwise. Just things that I thought, that's interesting. I'm not sure if it's interesting enough for me to have gone to it. And then I went virtually and it grabbed me. I think there's been things that have been more accessible without thinking about things like travel time, the actual physicality of having to do that traveling, things for me, disabled access is important. And so I haven't had to worry, is it going to be an accessible event in terms of being able to get there? So that's been fantastic. Some courses that have moved online, for example, I've done courses with Tinoev, the National Writing Centre for Wales, and Mount Gwathean, where I was hoping to go for a residential Welsh course, and unfortunately that wasn't able to happen, but being able to do that online. Learn Welsh has almost wholesale moved online for the moment, with a few exceptions where there's been the possibility of having a few face-to-face -face courses, but for the most part, and that's given me the wonderful opportunities looking at the different courses that the different Learn Welsh centres offer. So, for example, looking at summer schools, I was able to do one with Learn Welsh North East Wales. And again, I wouldn't have been able to do that if it had been in the flesh, but virtually it was brilliant. I was able to attend from home and it was one that had, was the best suited for me in terms of the hours and how it all sort of fitted together in the length of the course. And it was wonderful to be able to, to attend that. And another thing that's happened is we've had to look at different ways of celebrating things. So for example, just at the beginning of this month was Deeth Music Cymru, Welsh Music Day, an opportunity to celebrate Welsh language music. And I was really, really fortunate on behalf of, of learners from Learn Welsh, the National Learn Welsh Centre, to interview Tris Merion, internationally famous singer. And it was just a fantastic opportunity. And again, who knows if that opportunity would have come up in a, a world without COVID. So things 
that I had thought about doing, I was doing just for enjoyment. I'd, I'd always thought that learning Welsh would be something that would help my employability. But things like the craft courses I was doing in photography, that was something I was doing for me for enjoyment. But actually, that's turned into to something. Since, as my mum says, I can't keep every single thing I make, the things that I've been learning to make through my jewellery courses and then playing at home, I've started a small business to sell my, my jewellery. So Welsh has then certainly helped with my employability, as I've recently started as a Welsh tutor with Learn Welsh the Vale. And through that, I'm still learning, as well as still doing my own Welsh courses to, to develop my Welsh, and I'm now teaching, but I'm also taking a teaching course, one that's designed to teach me how to teach Welsh to adults. And I'm doing an ECDL course as well to be able to make sure I'm up with my technology to then hopefully be able to teach people that they want to be able to learn that through the medium of Welsh. So I'm now straddling both sides of adult learning as both a tutor and a student. And I hope that I never stop learning. And what I've been thinking is how can we keep the positives of the increased opportunities that have come about during these COVID times while getting the positives of the face to face learning. And someone who's been really inspirational to me has been my Welsh tutor, Anne Davies, who has been running what she calls a rice and chips course in, in Learn Welsh the Vale, where when we've been able to, we've had people actually in the classroom but it's also happening on Zoom at the same time. So if, for example, you're not able to come in, you're not feeling it's appropriate for you to come in, you're still part of the same course. So that's an idea, and I'm sure there's all sorts of different ideas, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more ideas today and working alongside you to make these things a reality. So diolch yn iawn, thank you ever so much. A daliolch keep at it. Diolch yn Yeah, thanks, Ryan. On that, um, I mean, I think your story from going from uh, learner starting out to um, now as a tutor in the Vale is absolutely fantastic. And um, congratulations, and thank you for sharing um, some of your story this morning. Um, and let's echo your comments as well about thank you to the sector as well. I think it's really important just to say I think that the way that the sector responded, and not not just adult learning, but also schools and colleges, universities just responding to that to the crisis and, and trying to deliver some form of continuity of learning has been fantastic. So completely support your comments. Um, right, I'm gonna move on then to our, our next speaker. Um, I'm gonna ask um, our chair, Jeff Greenwich, just to introduce um, uh, the minister. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, David. Jochen Vauri, Jan, and does it possibly be a shared Greg Vel Rhiannon? I know where I can speak in Welsh like Rhiannon, but I'd like to welcome you here uh, today and um, Welcome the Minister of Education, Kirsty Williams, for her, um, for her address. Um, but before I do that, uh, I'd like just to say a few words um, in recognition of um, uh, the Minister's support for education and skills over the years. Um, I recall you know, back in 2011 when, as a leader of Liberal Democrats, you agreed uh, to support the Welsh Government's uh, budget on the basis of securing a Welsh premium, which was an extra £20 million to spend on the education of the poorest um, of the poorest peoples uh, in Wales. And then again, we saw your ability uh, to see across departments, uh, across government, and where you supported the establishment of that uh, 50 million uh, pounds intermediate care fund to drive the integration of health, social services and housing. And you've always been at the forefront of curriculum reform in Wales and have been very supportive of us here at Learning and Work Cymru in our advocacy for adult and uh, family learning. You went to Moncton House and you saw uh, how that primary school was very much embedded within the, uh, the community and supporting family learning uh, provision there. And again, I personally thank you for, on behalf of adult learners in Wales for that inspirational um, Raymond Williams lecture back, uh, I think it was in 2018, where you shared your thoughts on developing a culture of lifelong learning and uh, the wider value of uh, adult education. And this was followed up the following year by the adult, in the Adult Learner Awards, where you presented the overall winner. And uh, I recall you sharing some thoughts uh, over dinner on the concept of a lifelong learning support for adults. 
And it's sometimes, you know, politicians share these thoughts, but then we recognize that you continue with this and you recognize the widening of access of part-time higher education where you oversaw the new funding support and you actually brought in that introduction to the right for, for lifelong learning. It's rare for a politician to connect with people at both an intellectual and emotional level and you've done that. And, you know, um, of course, you'd be missed by the education skills, the lifelong learning sector here in Wales. As a resident in Brecon Radisha, I'll no doubt be writing to you on issues uh, of uh, support for local community, as I've done over the past few years, no doubt annoying you with my, with my letters. But um, it's with heartfelt thanks from the adult learning sector that we uh, ask you today to uh, share your thoughts in your keynote address. So, uh, Kirsty Williams, thank you, and uh, we look forward to hearing your thoughts on adult learning. Thank you. Well, uh, Jeff, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to the conference this morning. And can I begin by thanking Rhiannon for sharing her story and her, uh, and her positivity. Uh, Rhiannon has shown very clearly this morning how resilience, hard work and determination can lead to success in learning and how it goes a long way to improve health and well-being as well as social benefits uh, and opportunities. And like you, Rhiannon, I hope in the rush to get back to normal, we don't lose some of the things that we've learned over these last uh, 12 uh, months. Uh, and can I just reinforce what Rhiannon said about the amazing Hey On Why Festival going online? I know the organizers are hoping to do the same uh, this year. So uh, thank you very much. Diocha, Diocha Galan, Rhiannon, Dayan. And um, just keep on going, as you said. Colleagues, no one could have predicted the juggernaut that is COVID and our lens, well, that's shifted significantly. As we heard from Rhiannon, we've all had to adjust our working, living and social lives and the ways in which we teach and learn. And I'm proud of the unyielding support of everyone in education who has made sure it made sure that learning has been able to continue in some form, despite the challenges that we have all faced. And I want to extend my gratitude to all of you working in the adult learning sector in Wales. Just like Rhiannon, your resilience and determination and support for learners during this part year, past year has been crucial, uh, especially for those learners who have needed your support the most. So thank you. As David said, as he opened this conference, we as the Welsh education family lost someone last week who did so much to support learners throughout his lifetime. Howell Francis was a pioneer, a professor, and of course, a parliamentarian. He was someone who did the thinking before he did the politics, and that's all too rare these days. His leadership, both intellectually and professionally, took Swansea University's adult education provision to new generations and communities and was always focused on learners as active citizens. Sometimes education debates are too narrowly focused on the transaction of a skill for a job. And of course, that is an important element. But for a functioning democracy and society, nothing is so essential as universal and lifelong access to and development of the experiences, knowledge and skills needed for true active citizenship. And Howell knew this. He knew this from his own history and roots in the Delice Valley, a Welsh speaking working class coalfield community. And as Rob Humphreys reminded me, Howell was also a Welsh internationalist. Indeed, his work connecting the South Wales Valley's experience with that of Appalachia speaks to my own family history. I'm sure that many of you as well share that history. My grandfather left Llanelli in the South Wales coal field for the mines of West Virginia. He said he could ruin his lungs for more money there than he could back at home. Howell saw the connections, the shared stories and experiences and the common culture of democratic voices that is crucial to real civic partnership between a university, its community, and its stories. And that's true whether that is in Ohio, Oxford, or Rundfloy. He was a brilliant educationalist and achieved so much, and it's truly 
a sad loss to education and to the civic vision of universities and to the idea of an international Wales. My deepest sympathies are extended to Meyer and his family, but Diolchawel, Diolchow Gallon. In the spirit of what I've just described, I think we can be proud of the progress that we have made in the last five years in lifelong learning and adult education. Part-time student numbers have seen a huge expansion. An official figure shows an 81% increase in the OU student numbers alone since I introduced student finance reform. Our Made in Wales professional learning accounts have supported over 2,000 individuals thanks to 15 and a half million pounds of Welsh Government investment and a strong partnership with our colleges. And we're widening in access in a radical way to postgraduate study across our nation. Much has been done, but as always, there is still more to do. Now, many of you will know that the progressive agreement between myself and the First Minister included a commitment to explore a Welsh right to lifelong learning. And I was pleased to see this policy reflected in the recent Commission on the College of the Future. However, I would be the first to admit that despite our many programmes, funding and initiatives to support lifelong learning, progress on a right or an entitlement has been too slow. As with other areas of policy, this, large year, this last year has had an impact on how we've been able or unable to take certain things forward. But I would urge colleagues here today to keep working with the government to help us move forward in a way that such an entitlement can move off the page and become real and transform people's lives. And I believe it could be a world leading initiative. The Adult Learning Network has also made significant progress in responding to the restructuring of adult learning following my statement in July 2019. Despite the challenges, a revised funding and planning model has been introduced to ensure a fair distribution of funds across our nation. Now, again, I'd admit that we haven't been able to give as much time as I would have liked to to consider whether an existing organisation could take the role of a national body for adult learning. But I'm committed to explore the feasibility of this, and I do hope that my successor will continue to pursue this vision. I'm sure that progress made by local authorities will have paved the way for long term sustainability of localised adult learning in Wales. And I do believe it is right to explore what benefits a national body could, act, could add to that endeavour. And finally, I remain convinced that bringing post-16 education into one organisation will allow us to meet any future challenges and see greater diversity of opportunity, particularly in a post-COVID world. Our proposed commission for tertiary education and research will have the operational freedom to determine how best to fulfil its duties of securing facilities for further education and training in Wales. And the draft bill demonstrates how provision can be flexible to the needs of individuals and communities using alternative locations and approaches and innovative support to enable flexible, short-term and part-time learning opportunities. I'm ever so grateful for the responses received during a time when the sector is under significant pressure and the summary of consultation responses will be published later this week. As mentioned by Jeff, and I hope many of you will know, we're also on the verge of passing new legislation for a new national curriculum. It focuses on the development of ethical informed young people ready to contribute and to be citizens of Wales and the world. And as I've said before, and indeed as David has pointed out, before, over the next period, this will mean that our education system, including the post compulsory sector, must also be focused on shared citizenship, common culture and empowering all with the knowledge and the skills to change society for the better. And as we review the future of qualifications, exams and assessment, learning credits, tertiary provision and more, these purposes have to be at the forefront of our thinking. Now, I understand there is to follow, there is much useful discussion to be had and focus workshops. Whilst I'm afraid I will have to leave you, my officials will remain present to ensure that the key points are captured and fed back to me. And on a personal note, I'd like to say thank you 
Thank you to the Learning and Work Institute and the wider adult education community for your support and challenges to me during my time as the Minister. I hope that you consider that I have been a friend, sometimes a critical friend, in putting lifelong learning at the heart of how we think, plan and support our national mission for education reform. Please keep up the good work and keep that relentless focus on social justice, raising standards for all, and tackling lowered expectations wherever they exist. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Diolch pal, diolch fawr. Thank you, thank you, Minister. Thank you for that um, address. Would you be able to take a couple of questions before, before you depart? Yes, of course, Jeff, absolutely. Oh. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think there were a couple coming through the um, uh, the chat, but um, whilst waiting for those, I just I just thought you know um, we know from our experience over the last year or so that um, adult learners studying within the adult learning adult and community learning community are also those same individuals that have suffered, that found themselves struggling financially, they're facing digital exclusion, and they're suffering from poor mental health and well-being. So my thought, my question really is, um, how do we better meet the needs of um, adult learners and give them the support they need to continue learning during and after the pandemic? Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, and I absolutely recognise, you know, the specific challenges uh, that some adult learners have been facing. And Rhiannon talked, didn't she, about uh, the sense of isolation uh, and how potentially, you know, that has made life uh, difficult. And Rhiannon has been able to overcome overcome that, but we recognise that some adult learners have not been uh, in such a, a fortunate uh, position. So I think um, we've been uh, able to support in some ways issues around digital exclusion uh, with additional uh, investment. And uh, the Welsh Government has uh, supported key services such as the Community Advice and Listening Line, and that's a, a mental health helpline for, for Wales, which is you know, a free phone number and text service available 24 hours a day, 365 days of the week for anyone who's got concerns about their own well-being or indeed the well-being of a, of a family member or friend. And uh, that's a confidential advice and support uh, service. Uh, but um, I think now as we begin our first tentative steps out of this particular period of lockdown, uh, we're beginning to, you know, to really develop the deep thinking behind a COVID resilience plan uh, and that's to look at, um, you know, the impact of COVID and learning and education in all areas. And uh, uh, we've recently put in place an online survey to be able to gain an understanding of the impact of COVID-19 and learners' experience of well-being, the downsides and the upsides. Because as we heard from Rhiannon, there's definitely been challenges, but there has been different opportunities and, and different ways for people to engage. Uh, so uh, that survey and the findings of that are going to help inform future delivery of post-16 learning, uh, particularly in relation to the further development and mainstreaming of blended learning, uh, so that um, there are different opportunities and different ways for people uh, to, to engage. And I think we have to look at it from, I'm very keen we don't look at it from a deficit model. Uh, learning has undoubtedly been interrupted, but it has carried on. Uh, again, as Rhiannon has, uh, uh, has referenced, and it's about making sure uh, that um, we, don't, uh, we don't constantly talk about the need for catch up or, or learning loss, but recognize that interruption, recognize that everybody's situation and story will be different, uh, but looking to be able to respond positively to that, but also to incorporate the new learning uh, that, um, that we've done uh, during this time, uh, recognizing that the old normal didn't work for everybody and the new normal gives us a chance to, to reset and to, and to do something better. Thank you, Minister, while I, while I mute uh, myself from that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that sort of focus on positivity and on the, on the learning experience. Clearly, Bendy Learning is something which we've used now and we need to uh, continue mm -hmm. and to move forward. I've got a question in the chat from one of the, the delegates uh, and the question is, you know, what one action would the minister like to see the next Welsh government take to support lifelong learning? Um, well, Jeff, if I can refer back to what I've just said in my, in, in, you know, in my in my speech, uh, I really hope that the new person who was lucky enough to have this job, and it really is the best job in the government, I believe, 
uh, is to make real on that promise and that ambition of a right to lifelong learning uh, and drawing together all the different uh, streams and activity that we have into, me into making that meaningful. And, you know, I hold my hands up, you know, we had hoped to make some further progress this year on that. COVID has interrupted that work, but I really hope that the new minister will pick up that challenge and work with the sector to understand how we make that how we make that real. Uh, and you know, uh, you know, and I understand there are dissenting voices out there, but I absolutely believe, uh, you know, uh, in the purposes of the new commission on tertiary education. Uh, we are too small a nation uh, to have institutions uh, competing against each other, duplicating. We need, as we have done during COVID, an all shoulders to the wheel approach that is relentlessly focused on individuals and students and learners to allow them to move seamlessly through that system mm. at times which is relevant and works for them. Uh, and so I really do hope that uh, the new uh, the new government will pick up the draft bill mm. by all means, you know, reflect on the consultations as we're doing at the moment, make uh, amendments to that bill. But I do believe that bringing the sector uh, and uh, a single planning uh, authority, I think, is absolutely crucial to the to the way uh, to the way forward. Thank, thank you. Thank you for those thoughts uh, about that, uh, about collaboration and that. Um, that seamless view um, and looking to see how different parts of the sector can uh, can work together. That brings me along to thinking about the community and thinking about um, uh, how do you see um, community learning being developed um, within community venues after the pandemic? Well, well, I think, you know, absolutely there is there is a role for you know bringing that learning as localized to people as possible especially for those individuals you know who have been out of learning before and are taking those tentative steps you know doing that in a community that uh, you're familiar with you know uh, is is obviously hugely beneficial uh, but as we've just heard from 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 Rihanna I think we need to we need to combine that with a with a new approach to uh, accessible learning uh, you know as we've just heard from Rhiannon you know not all venues are potentially as accessible even within the community there are people for under, you know for very very good reasons who feel that they can't participate in that kind of atmosphere but actually a combination of that and and, and, and blended learning really gives us the opportunity to open up learning to even more uh, even more individuals so, but um, yeah, absolutely. There's got to be a place of working uh, with, you know, uh, different venues. One of the most uplifting things that I've done this last year, and believe me, there haven't been many uplifting moments. They really, really haven't been. Uh, but I recently met with a group of mums who are on a project that is working out of Cate's High School. And you talked about the experience that I had with David down in Pembrokeshire in a primary school. They, well, this is you know, community focused learning based around a, a high school here in Cate's. Uh, and that just so positive, so uplifting, making a huge difference to, to, to families, both the children who are being better supported in their education, but also their mums and dads and carers who are now also, you know, learning and, uh, and, and working with that school. And I would love to see, you know, we've taken some tentative steps about having a capital fund uh, that local authorities can apply to, you know, to build community facilities alongside their schools so that we can get the community learning alongside children. And, you know, that kind of model, I think, is transformative for the lives of everybody involved. The school, uh, which sees better parental engagement, better outcomes for kids, but also, you know, in this case, it was mostly mums, mums who were you know, learning new skills and then translating those skills into new employment opportunities or simply social opportunities where they were getting out, and out of the house or meeting people that they would never have done so. And yeah, more of that, you know, would be absolutely amazing. And as I say, it's one of the most uplifting things that I've been able to do this year is meet those, meet those women, extraordinary women uh, working alongside Cate's High School. Brilliant. Thank, thank you for the, thank you for those thoughts. I, I get a real sense that you know you're pressing the next government to look to that right for lifelong learning, 
We're also pressing the sector to collaborate more, bring schools, colleges, and community learning venues together and to make the most of, of the technology. Can I push you a bit on, um, on the workforce now? Because um, one of the issues the pandemic has highlighted within the sector has been the importance of skills and development of the workforce. So thinking beyond the short term, how can we better invest and prioritise in the professional development of, of the workforce, including both adult and community learning and ESOL provision? Oh gosh, yes. Well, um, you're absolutely right. We need to uh, ensure that, you know, if we create a right to lifelong learning for the individual, we have to have the infrastructure uh, to support that right. And that does mean making sure we have uh, highly trained, highly motivated and better supported um, uh, professional body uh, to, deliver, to deliver on those rights. Uh, so, you know, uh, we've done a lot of reform uh, during this government in uh, initial teacher education reform and professional development for staff within schools. And I think it's absolutely right uh, that we turn our attention uh, to ensuring that that level of investment uh, and, and support uh, is now looked at uh, in other aspects of education. So we're just committing to a review uh, of um, the uh, professional qualifications for FE lecturers uh, and support for them. But we also need to you know, make sure that, as I said, that attention to reform of training opportunities and ongoing professional development and support uh, is taken forward in the next government right the way across the education, uh, education sector so that we have the workforce there that has the, the skills and the support uh, to, to make real uh, any right to lifelong learning that the next government is able to implement. Thank you. We, we've pressed you on um, what you're going to do, what your thoughts are. I'd like this, you to share with us what you think that we can do as a, as a sector. So how can the sector best work with the next Welsh Government on um, education and lifelong learning legislation that's needed to, to move us forward? You know, coming out of COVID, coming out of Brexit, what would you want the sector to be doing? Um, well, I think, uh, first of all, it's really important that uh, you continue to hold the government's feet to the fire and the minister's feet to the fire uh, on this uh, and, and, and to keep up that uh, and to keep up that pressure. And I think, you know, what I've always found most useful in dealing with the sector is the solutions focus that you always have. So looking at the wider government agenda and demonstrating to the new minister and indeed to the new, you know, to any you know, new administration of how this sector can help the government achieve its goals. So we're just thinking about, you know, just thinking about um, what do we need in terms of a post economic recovery from COVID? You know, we know that there are some jobs that uh, that have been lost during this uh, time, which are never coming back. Uh, but there are going to be new opportunities and making sure that we're working with individuals to take advantage of those new, new opportunities, I think is going to be absolutely uh, crucial. Uh, so I think, you know, again, it is about demonstrating how adult learning can deliver against those strategic objectives that the next government will, uh, will set itself. Uh, and, you know, and, you know, reaching out across the sector as I said, to try, I mean, to try and develop a consensus of how the sector can move forward, uh, and uh, and to uh, and to break down potentially some of the barriers, or to break down the perception in some some areas that it is by maintaining splendid isolation is the way that you protect yourself uh, at, or, or your institution or your part of the sector. Uh, I don't think that's true. I think uh, it is a collective ende endeavour uh, that actually will drive the sector forward and will be better for all of us rather than uh, creating silos where we desperately hang on to what we've, we've got. Uh, and, and, you know, the sector has been brilliant over this year about responding, uh, responding to that. So, um, yeah, but you've got to keep politicians' feet to the fire. On, on that note, you know, I think the uh, no protectionism no silos and reaching out across the sector to develop the consensus. That's a, quite a clear stay, David, for, uh, for our adult and community learning sector. But alongside that, using evidence to demonstrate the impact mm. of what we're actually doing. 
and using that collaboration, using that impact to uh, to hold the minister's feet to the fire. Uh, lovely phrase to end on, um, uh, Kirsty. I think we will um, we'll follow your advice uh, on that uh, particular score. And thank you once again for uh, your years of support for us in adult and community learning. You will be missed, and that is most sincere. Um, as I said before, it is rare that um, politicians can uh, connect at that intellectual and that emotional level, and you've done that, and you will be missed in education skills and lifelong learning. Thank you. I pass on. Oh, thank you, today. Jeff. I'm going to miss you guys too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you, Kirsty, as well. And, and I'm really pleased you mentioned as well there the. Um, the, your visit to Taste High School, because that's, that's another great example, I think, of a fantastic community facility. Um, well, I'm really pleased as well, we are going to be, as well as hearing from Kirsty, the next session is going to be focused on um, some of the other political parties in the Senate. And um, as we you all know, there's elections taking place in May this year, where we'll have the opportunity to change the government, uh, change policy, hopefully hopefully to build on success that we've uh, that we've had in the sector but also to reflect and refresh and to hopefully, you know, um, try to move the sector forward. Whatever happens, as you know, obviously there, Kirsty stepping down, we know we will have a new education minister. Uh, we will have a, you know, we, whatever party or parties uh, form that form that administration, we will have a new minister. And it's important for us, I think, to, to establish quickly the importance of adult and community learning um, for, the, for the new minister and for the new government. Um, really pleased though, to be able to um, welcome and introduce our next three speakers. Um, a political party, political panel, uh, it's easy for me to say, uh, with Susie Davis from the Welsh Conservatives, Bethan Syed from uh, Plaid Cymru, and Hevin David, who I think is on the screen as well, there we are, uh, Hevin uh, from Welsh Labour. Um, gonna ask each of them to speak for three minutes, uh, for five minutes if I can, and then just um, take some questions uh, from either myself or from uh, you as delegates. Um, if I can uh, potentially ask Bethan if you were okay to go first, and I, I should say as well um, before we start that, as well as thanking Kirsty for her contribution, there's at least two of our panel who won't be returning to the Senate um, uh, in in May, and the third obviously is up to the electors. But um, just to say um, a big thank you to Susie and to Bethan for your contribution and for your support for our organisation, but most importantly for your support for learners. Um, during this the, the years you've been in the Senate and the Assembly. So just um, on behalf of, the, of behalf of learning and work and behalf of the whole sector, a massive thank you to, to both of you for your hard work and for your um, support for learners, which I think is the most important thing you can do as politicians. But uh, Bethan, if I can come to you first then for, to, to speak first about um, Plaid Cymru's plans for kind of the next government. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, David, and thank you for inviting me uh, to speak at this conference uh, here today. And, um, you know, uh, I won't be the next education minister either, although I think I could probably give it a good go, you know. Um, but hey, um, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps in another 10 years or so, who knows, who knows. Um, but I have been enjoying doing the post-16 education shadow minister brief for Plaid Cymru um, for the past couple of year years, albeit taking a brief uh, break for maternity leave uh, last year and um, I heard uh, a bit about what the minister was saying there um, in terms of the challenges and I just firstly like to say thank you to everybody who's been working in the sector especially during these difficult times during the pandemic when people haven't been able to go to their usual places um, of work on a wide scale basis albeit we do know that some learners have been going in um, who do need to complete courses um, and such um, but you know most of the people who have been receiving education have been doing so um, from Zoom as we are here today um, and it has been a challenge but one that perhaps will allow us to adapt for the future when it can uh, be done but also I think we have to acknowledge that if that's going to happen that that, that has to come with uh, resources as well uh, for example I chair the Welsh Language uh, Culture and Communications Committee uh, in the Senate uh, and the Adult uh, Learning in Welsh uh, uh, programme and they saw cuts to their budget uh, at, um, at this particular time because um, the Minister said well actually things are going digital and we can perhaps put the money elsewhere well I don't think 
think it necessarily means because we're going digital uh, that, that uh, resources need to be tightened or that things can be uh, cut. So I think that if there are going to be changes post-COVID, we need to consider all uh, all of the issues that uh, face uh, people who are learning um, and how that will affect their futures. I also think it's important to say at the start, and I know you've probably heard this many, many times, but I don't think adult learning or lifelong learning should just be about what skills can fit the economy. I think it's about how we develop as people. And I know that many um, people that I've met uh, through this time have, have taken part in courses just because they feel they want to do something to excite their minds during these really difficult times. So I know lots of people who've done wreath making courses uh, and uh, companies in Swansea have sent them the, the wreath packs uh, at Christmas time to make them so that they can feel part of something. So they'll all make their wreaths and they'll all then show the others what they've done. You know, a small thing you may think, but it's something small that's mean, meaningful to somebody's life if they feel that they perhaps are sinking into a depression or that they feel that their well-being is being impacted by uh, the pandemic. So one small thing I think to really emphasise is it's not just about, you know, what skills are in the, this economic area or, and what can be helpful uh, to the wider economic agenda, albeit that is really important. So a few things that Applied Cymru will be saying in the election, um, uh, albeit we haven't uh, launched the manifesto, is um, this new emphasis on a, a new skills framework for Wales, um, looking at automation and how we can deal with that in the future. Um, in terms of employment and training, we would be wanting to implement new employment and training teams at FE colleges, modelled on the Swedish Job Security Councils, which I think are really interesting to look at. Um, clearly in Sweden, there's 70% of people who are in trade unions, so they're in a much stronger basis to have that social partnership. So if there is a redundancy situation, their negotiating skills are really quite good. Although I think they are, you know, they're okay on a Wales level, but there are always still room for imp improvements. And I know the Welsh Government have introduced personal learning accounts, but Plaid Cymru would probably go a step further and introduce a lifetime learning allowance. So this would be a mix of grants, loans and right to free provision. I'm quite passionate about if you've already done a first degree um, and you want to do something again, that you're not penalised because of that. And you have this allowance after the age of 25 years old in your bag, so to speak, so that you can utilise it. So we would say starting with something like £5,000 of a grant um, that would be available, um, probably starting with those who have been recently made redundant um, or those on low incomes and then progress it um, as we would find the income to be able to do so. Um, but that would be able to be used for maintenance costs. We know that's a massive issue, um, as well as um, added loans potentially for more expensive courses. And like I said, we'd initially trial this on um, certain sectors of society. Um, that's if you're older then, uh, or if you've lost your job, uh, but you're not um, feeling that you have to root out that money from your savings, that that's something there for you. Um, I think, as we've already heard from the Minister, we have to reverse the decline in part-time and mature study that's been there since 2011. We've negotiated with Welsh Government additional funding in the budget for further education um, when there was a cut made. £10 million was negotiated recently. But in terms of community learning, that's been decimated over the years, and we really have to turn that around. You know, when we've got transport providers that are not going to certain areas of Wales, when we know that they, people can't get to those uh, facilities, is community learning is integral to the future of our nation to make sure uh, that if you live in Blind Gwynnivy, you don't have to get to Patol, but for nine o'clock for that course, you can partake in it in the local community centre and you can develop your skills to be able to be uh, the person you want to be for the future. And just to finish, I think um, uh, Heaven will know as well, we did a piece of work on the regional skills partnerships on the economy committee. You know, we've got to look at all of that and how they interact with the further education system. Um, um, make sure they're properly financed if they're going to be financed at all um, so that they can do their job that they need to do uh, and to ensure that we have uh, a strong skill sector uh, here in Wales. Ultimately, we need to be supporting uh, people throughout their lives so that when they get to a certain age, they don't feel, well, there's nothing more for me to contribute to society. There's always something we can contribute, whatever we age we are uh, here in Wales. Thank you, Bethan. And um, uh, I think it's really interesting. And I will come back with questions to all three of you as a panel, if that's okay. There's lots in there, particularly around the lifelong lifelong 
learning allowance, um, which is really interesting. On a personal note as well, I, I do hope that there will be an opportunity to, for you to come back into politics. I think it's really important that, you know, as someone who's worked in politics with kids, I think it's really, really hard. And um, actually being able to kind of come back a little bit later um, uh, would be, I think it's, well, hopefully you do come back anyway at some point. Um, I'm going to pass on now, if I can, to Susie. Um, Susie Davis from the Welsh Conservatives. Um, you can introduce your kind of pitch, then um, I'll ask Kevin to um, speak after that. Hi, uh, well, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, can I just begin by saying a big thank you to you all? I know this last year has been an absolute nightmare for, for everybody, really. But trying to persuade some of the people perhaps that you work with to stick with uh, any kind of education, I think has been a really tough ask, not, not uh, from their point of view only, but for those of you who perhaps have been uh, part of contributing to their education. You, you know, you've got your own pressures with things like homeschooling um, and caring responsibilities like, like everybody else. So uh, thank you from me. Um, I think this is, a, I mean, I, I've only had this portfolio for just over a year, so you'll have to bear with me if there are still gaps in my, in my knowledge. But um, I just want to say thank you to David and some of the rest of you that have been speaking to me fairly recently about what might be going into the Conservative Manifesto. Uh, we're not quite there yet with our manifesto, so there's still still an opportunity for me to pick up something from uh, this today, which might still be be influential. But the the, the the sort of core of our thinking at the moment is that we need um, different routes to excellence, if you like. At, at the moment, the way to really getting the most out of your own potential it gets narrower and narrower the older you get. And one of my main concerns for for some years now has been this sort of, you know, the rush to master's degrees because actually your ordinary degrees aren't, uh, or sort of your, your honours degrees don't seem to be enough anymore. And actually the routes into that are, are shrinking despite the fact that we have uh, opportunities for things like degree apprenticeships now, which is an area which certainly in our manifesto will be expanding quite considerably. But underneath all that is this kind of rush to credentialism, I think it's been called, which is that you have to have uh, the, the best degree or the best qualification in something which doesn't really recognise uh, the experience of education in other ways. Uh, and that's something that, with the, I, I've tried to weave into the, the draft chapter that we've got in our manifesto. So just um, briefly to run through some of the ideas, I can't say they've all been pinned down yet, but it'll give you an idea, is, um, is this idea of rights to lifelong learning. Now, I know the minister was very keen on this, but uh, you know, both my colleagues here will know that I'm always quite resistant to the word rights unless there are remedies and responsibilities that go with it. Uh, and it's a, it's a worry for me that if we just say everyone has a right to um, lifelong education, what precisely does that mean? And what can somebody do if they're denied that right? Uh, and that takes us down into a cul-de-sac, I think, when it, it comes to what we're actually trying to do with it, which is effectively make sure that whoever wants um, uh, lifelong learning can have it. Uh, and that's more to do with resources, as Bethan said, and the availability of, of learning, which doesn't necessarily need to be formal courses after all. So um, I think it might already be mentioned, uh, possibly, well, actually Bethan hinted at it as well, this idea of learning in your community so that you don't have to traipse off at nine o'clock in the morning down to a formal college setting. One of the things we've learned from COVID, and Kirsty certainly mentioned this, is that the idea of um, learning from a hub. Uh, we've done some work on this, uh, on the, on the uh, skills uh, uh, EIS committee that we've got in the assembly, which Evan is also on, about whether uh, the idea of localised hubs where you can tap in again through the computer, through um, IT, it's something that's really got legs because um, I think all of us are probably a bit cheese off now about doing everything from um, our living rooms and whether this possibility of working from uh, a local community centre is something that needs to be developed rather than something that gets cut back first, which is what Bethan was talking about. I mean, I'm a little bit sceptical about it, but if it makes life easier to get access to learning, then um, it certainly needs to be explored further. I mean, I've got to say, I mean, my, my, my own computer skills, such as they are, are entirely due to community learning. When I did a, a course thousands of years ago, it, it just in the local school in an evening. Uh, and without that, I don't think I'd even been able to use Zoom, if I'm quite honest, because it's just this whole big part of having, stepping into a field that you may not feel comfortable with. And that's something else that we're quite keen on, is using the current changes to the curriculum 
to introduce the idea of non-general, um, not just non-general qualifications, but non-general qualification learning much earlier into the school curriculum. Um, at the moment, everything is being treated equally in the curriculum, but we think there are opportunities to specialise. And I put that in speech marks a little earlier in the school curriculum so that you, um, the opportunities for learning outside the school classroom become available um, to our learners when they're younger. That, of course, will need people like yourselves. It'll need colleges in particular, but also um, some universities. We've seen some excellent mentoring schemes from Welsh universities working with uh, uh, schools. Uh, look, looking at this as a, as a coherent whole, if you like. And that leads me to talk on to the, let's call it the PSET body, um, which Kirsty also mentioned. I, I, I'm a bit sceptical about this one as well, because we seem to be going from you know, a very fragmented picture straight to one body that's doing everything. And I'm a little bit resistant to that, particularly because I think colleges and universities in particular, but I, um, I may hear from you in the questions, um, need to retain some serious autonomy in this. And I'm particularly keen on the role of colleges when it comes to uh, how, how apprenticeships are, are administered, if you like. Um, I think there are some problems with the, with the framework as it is at the moment, and it's not uh, necessarily producing the best results, particularly with things like shared apprenticeships. Uh, the, just a couple of other things, as I know my time is up. I'm very keen on community learning being part of what you can offer to progress through um, the education system as we have it at the moment. And um, I go back to this different routes to excellence. And I think what you, what you may be learning in the community should play a greater role in what you offer to, let's say, a university when you're applying to um, uh, do a, a course of study uh, there. Um, we're also looking very well, if I think we've got commit, we've got commitment to this now is that we've spotted this gap in, in the progression story. And that tends to be around what we call level three learning. So that's sort of a level um, uh, sort of step, if you like, or obviously equivalent. Uh, and we're going to be putting, well, we, we, we're promising, uh, we're just calling it a second chance fund at the moment, because while it would be great to think everybody can have endless opportunities to do everything, that's got to be paid for. And while I completely agree with everybody on this call that education is not just about the economy, you do need to make some distinction here, I think, between helping people to progress in careers which are not just good for them, but also for the, uh, the economy of Wales, and that sort of self-fulfillment, um, well-being uh, kind of strand that may need to be differently financed. That's what I'm uh, basically saying. So this is a slightly confusing um, end to my, my, uh, my offer, because I haven't spoken about things like shared apprenticeships um, and part-time study, shorter degrees, shorter courses, and all that kind of thing. But um, hopefully we can, that can come out through questions. Um, just finally wanted to say, um, we're committed to putting more money actually into um, the National Centre for Learning Welsh and Caledai Cymru, because we think we, um, that Welsh is a, a tool, not just of personal fulfillment, but uh, of economic value, as Rhiannon said right at the beginning, is gaining in importance. Uh, and actually it's at this community level learning and FE level that I think it might have the biggest bang for its buck. Um, one of the last things we want to do is for people to see Welsh as some sort of elitist skill. Um, and so um, any HE uh, providers here, um, I'm afraid I'm going to be focusing our attention on Welsh language uh, support um, in different areas rather than HE, although obviously not reducing the work that Collega Camry is doing with you. Thanks. Thank you, Susie. And again, I think there's quite a lot in there that hopefully we'll pick up on in questions. But I love the phrase, um, different routes for excellence, because I think it is about those different entry points for learners, but also recognising that it's not, that we want we want excellence for all learners, we want every learner to be able to fulfil their potential, no matter where they start from, no matter where they, they want to end. Um, yeah, I think I'll definitely pick up on that, and hopefully on the PSET issue as well. I'm um, going to head over now to Heaven. Um, the, the, uh, representing Welsh Labour. Uh, so again, same for you, same having your five minutes or so, and then we'll hopefully take some questions from myself and from um, the panel. Okay, can you hear me, Dave? Yeah, yeah we can. Yeah. Okay, I've had some technical issues. Um, the interesting thing is for uh, our own personal reasons, the, the members of the panel, I noticed that this panel session was billed Welsh Government Session, 
for own personal reasons, the three of us are not going to be in Welsh government after the election, regardless of the fortunes of our political parties. Um, so what you know, I'm, I'm going to fully intend to continue my position of constructive opposition um, that I've maintained through the past Senate. And, uh, uh, and I think uh, Susie and Beth are both a huge loss uh, to the Senate in, in the next, uh, in the sixth term, regardless of what happens to me. Um, and and I've, I've got to say, I've, I've worked incredibly well with both Susie and Beth and, um, over the past five years, and they, they are going to be missed. They really are going to be missed um, in, in, in the sixth uh, Senate. Uh, the key point for me, I mean, my background is, is uh, as a university lecturer, my first days as a university, lect university lecturer were uh, teaching part-time professional students. I used to teach the Chartered Institute of Personal, Deve Personal Development um, in, in the early days of my career. And, uh, and much of those students, and also uh, part-time professional MBAs, much of those students I've seen now um, popping up in Welsh government uh, in different roles in, in the public sector and also in the private sector. Um, some of them actually delivering training themselves. Uh, and, and that gave me an early career insight into the value of, of professional uh, development. Uh, and, and the fact that if you are at that point in your career that you need learning, which is, which is every point of your career, it needs to be open and available to you. And from my point of view, the best employers were the ones that funded that training for their, for their workforce. So it isn't just about government, it's also about employers and enabling uh, their workforce to grow. And I'm always thinking of that saying, you know, what happens if we train our staff and they leave? Or what happens if you don't train them and they stay? Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue and you need to get, employers need to get to grips with this. But the role of government, I think, in a lot of this is to ensure parity of esteem, to ensure that the value of qualifications, regardless of what they are and where they come from, are valued equally across the board. So the, 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 the uh, importance, I think, is accredited professional development. So the professional development you gain is accredited by a recognised body. And I would say... Uh, the, the Education Workforce Council, for example, have a huge role in giving accreditation to qualifications. You have those qualifications like Chartered Charter Institute of Personal Development that I've mentioned, CIPD, but you've got CIM, ACCA, CIMA, you've got the various different professional bodies. But there needs to be a, a, an accreditation system that gives value to qualifications that are gained wherever you gain them. Um, and, and through that, you can grow these professional learning communities that have already been uh, that have already been alluded to in, by, by Bethan and Susie. I think that's, that's really important. And I think a serious government must commit to that in the next term. Um, and one of the pieces of work we've mentioned, the Education and Infrastructure and Skills Committee, as Susie mentioned, one of the pieces of work we've done has been with regard to degree apprenticeships and the value of degree apprenticeships and higher level apprenticeships. The Welsh Government's run a pilot programme of degree apprenticeships, um, disappointingly not able to achieve gender balance. Um, which was something that I think uh, needed to be addressed, but also uh, importantly did show a value of degree and high level apprenticeships, the universities offering them, but it was a pilot program. I think, and this isn't university shared across the sector, but I think degree level apprenticeships need to be expanded. Now, um, Collega Camry have come to me and said, well, you know, why are you arguing for that? And, and what's the justification? And I think the, the justification is a route through from 16 to um, uh, 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 onwards through a, a vocational career. If you're going to offer an academic career, fine, it's, it's out there, it happens. But we also need to offer vocational careers. And I think topping off at high level of, uh, and degree level apprenticeships is the way forward to achieve that. Um, I think uh, social partnership is also important. And you would expect that from a Welsh Labour member. We must have a degree of social partnership in everything we do. So. Uh, Bethan mentioned regional skills partnerships, for example, they can be a body that brings together uh, different uh, uh, stakeholders, different, different people who can deliver um, uh, parity of esteem and, and uh, a career of learning. Uh, and, and I think that commitment to a strategic um, workforce plan for, for professions and for, for everyone in the job can be delivered through that. But you've got to engage with unions, you've got to engage with employers, with learning providers, and I think there's a community that can be developed in a, in a way that is better than currently exists. Um, and that, that is a challenge for the future, which brings me to the single strategic authority for education, which uh, is acronym TURKU uh, at the moment. It hasn't been developed yet because the bill was ditched because of COVID. 
I, I've, I've got, I share Susie's skepticism uh, a little, uh, constructive skepticism about it, because the, the university professionals I've spoken to have said, well, why do we need to change what exists? And that's always a good question to ask. Um, leaping to a strategic body uh, is uh, a, um, a challenging act. And I think it needs to be done in a, in, a, in a way that engages with all parts of the sector. And that comes back again to parity of esteem. It happens, just so happens, a HEFQ is in my constituency. Um, they, there's nobody there at the moment, partly because the building was flooded last year, and partly because of COVID. Uh, but the further education uh, civil service was on the second floor of the HEFQ building. Um, it wouldn't be good enough just to say, well, we're going to rebadge the HEFQ building, the Turkey building, and move the, everybody into one room. You know, the, there is a huge challenge and the question you need to come back to, and I'd like to hear from panel members, uh, from, from um, delegates here, why do, you, why do you need that single unitary uh, uh, higher education, further higher education authority, and what will it deliver? Because if you're just going to be producing a, a newly badged organisation, then do you really need to, to uproot everything in order to achieve that? So that kind of scepticism is, is a good question. I recognise, of course, Hazelcorn has put forward some very good arguments for why that needs to happen. Um, I'd also like to talk about apprenticeships just, just to finish. Um, I'm very proud to say that uh, between 2015 and 2020, 4,070 4, Welsh Government funded apprenticeships were created in the Caerphilly constituency. Um, and only Cardiff South and Penarth and Torvine have had more uh, apprenticeships developed. And, and the Welsh Government is, is, is hitting its target of creating 100,000 apprenticeships and, and exceeding that target, which is significant and important because when they made that promise at the beginning of the last term, uh, I myself thought, well, that is quite a challenge, but it appears that is being met. One thing about apprenticeships is that the last uh, um, uh, official statistics I've got tell me that 57% of those apprenticeships were over 25. Um, and I think you need to be looking at how you move into apprenticeships at school leaver age, how you move in uh, uh, school leavers, students into uh, apprenticeships to deliver that parity of esteem that I mentioned at the beginning. And I think that's really where we need to be. COVID has changed the landscape. What are our future skills going to be? They're, they're going to be different. And are the apprenticeships that we're delivering now the kind of apprenticeships that, uh, at all levels that we need in the future? I think we need to audit that and understand how the learning landscape has changed as a result uh, of the coronavirus crisis. Thanks, Evan. Um, and thank you, Bethan and Susie, as well, for that. Um, we've got a number of questions that are coming in um, from delegates on Slider. So I was going to try and pick up on a couple of the kind of the themes that are coming in from there. Um, one of the ones I think is probably the most important for us is, you know, um, with, when we've had this, we have had a switch to online learning. But obviously that that has potentially excluded some of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged learners, the ones without the kit, ones without the confidence and the skills um, to be able to access learning. So um, within that, how can we how can we ensure a return to face to face learning to 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 better support those learners who've been most disadvantaged, but also alongside of that as well? Um, how can we ensure a focus on those learners needing basic and essential skills provision? I think we are right to talk about some of the higher level learning around degree apprenticeships, you know, talk about masters, all those kind of different things. There's an awful lot of learners and people in our communities without basic and essential skills at the moment as well. And I wonder how can we support those learners kind of post pandemic? And if I come to Bethan first on that one, if that's OK. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, I've raised questions in the Senate uh, with uh, the minister um, based on conversations with the sector as to how to get people back into colleges or apprenticeships um, and to have some version of a plan. Um, I even was asking about whether we needed to extend the term and what that would then mean for those in the sector, be it the students or for the, the lecturers or the tutors in any given circumstance. She told me that many people who did need to reach qualifications were going and we're able to utilise those resources. But I have heard from the sector, uh, notably, as has been mentioned, Colleague Cumbria saying that people are struggling and, and uh, would like to be able to get back in. For example, if you want to become a plumber or an electrician, you can't be doing that through 
through Zoom, it's very difficult to show that practical work um, in that way. That's what they're telling me. If I'm wrong and you can do that through Zoom, then please correct me. Um, but I was being told by the sector that those things really need to be seen face to face in a COVID friendly way. So I would say we need to be coming forward with a plan now to ensure that we can um, incorporate colleges into the, the forward thinking, because I feel and uh, as genuine as the, the, the education minister is about the, the young children going back this week and such, I feel always that further education and adult learning gets forgotten in the mix of discussion and so we need to be thinking of those things because we we don't want to be um, thinking in a year's time about the losses a community has because of the fact that they haven't been able to get into those colleges so we do need to have a, a plan now to get those uh, young people or people from all ages back into the colleges for their study um, in re regards to digital learning, then that's something we would obviously want to expand um, in in government. And we're looking at the Open University as well to, to, to lead with us on, on that. Uh, I think it's really important that we have a mixture. You know, at the end of the day, there are going to be people who, you know, for example, if you're a working parent or if you have caring needs, you will need that to be flexible, uh, which is why uh, we've offered this lifetime learning allowance so that we can, you know, say to people that if you are, um, you're coming up education at a later age that you're not penalized for that and that we can have more emphasis on part-time flexible learning as opposed to the three-year degree that you do at 18 we've seen from this pandemic haven't we that that has to change you know my sister is in her third year at Bristol and she's done nothing um const constructive outside of her um four walls of her uh, um housing that she's in in Bristol she hasn't been able to have that um full experience um, of what that was going to offer her and so she's realized that it doesn't have to be that you know that that thing that people tell you you have to do when you leave school that it can be different that you can mix and match she's gone into schools to, to volunteer because she wants to be a teacher she's done things differently because she's had to so that can apply to the wider population I think in terms of how we look at um, how we develop education um, into the future and I'd just like to finish I know this question is an odd piece but I would like to say we would commit to having a review and to try and incorporate the sector together if we were in government because I've asked the minister on numerous occasions how do we keep people in Wales how do we stop the brain drain and she says to me well it's up to the individual institutions that's not good enough to me we need to have a cohesive approach throughout the sector so that we can understand what uh, is happening what the trends are why we can't potentially retain as many students uh, here in Wales and if we don't have that commission or if we don't have a review and if we do have people doing everything their own way into the future, then I don't think we're going to be able to get that cohesiveness that we need. No, thanks, Heather. I think it's a really important point around cohesiveness. And I think for us, I suppose, as a as a, an organisation, one of the most important points about that is to make sure that we're also focusing on different types of learners. It isn't just a kind of traditional learner who goes from A level uh, to university and on to into careers. The learners are all different stages of their lives. Uh, particularly some of the most vulnerable learners, carers, young adult, um, uh, care experienced young people, etc. So I think you're completely right to look at how we can support those learners. Um, Susie, can I come to you to, for um, the question there around how can we support excluded disadvantaged learners around face to face learning, but also um, the importance of basic um, and essential skills within uh, within provision? Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I don't think it's as easy as the question implies, really, because it's a question that's asked repeatedly. And the fact we're still ask, asking it suggests that there's no straightforward answer to this. Um, I, I would start with um, a, a preliminary question, which is, I mean, why are we still, uh, you know, in this day and age, still struggling to ensure that our, our learners are leaving school or college without those basic skills and without those uh, uh, key skills as well? Um, I'm hoping that there's some work that can be done within the curriculum that resolves some of those problems. So that we have people leaving school um, or college of 18, which is another pledge of ours, um, we, uh, that those numbers will be fewer. Uh, obviously, the big role here is for community learning, isn't it? Uh, but uh, learning in a different way. Uh, one of the reasons I, I suspect that people leave school now with some of the problems we're talking about is because how they learn in schools doesn't fit their learning style. Uh, some people flourish later in life as well, uh, again, which is another reason why the opportunity for these skills needs to just remain um, uh, available for, uh, I'm using that word as carefully as I can, um, forever, because, uh, you know, without them, 
it limits what you can do with your life, I think. The issue of digital exclusion is one that the education se uh, sector is facing now, isn't it? We, uh, we hear, don't, don't we both of you, that, we, that millions of pounds worth of kits is going out to schools and colleges at the moment. And yet we also hear from our own constituents that they're not either not being able to use it because they don't have decent broadband or they can't afford the data. Um, as well as some occasions where actually the kitchens isn't there. Uh, so I think it, for a different audience almost, there seems to be some work needed here with actual broadband providers about how they should, they can be supported to make sure that people have got access to broadband and data in a way that's different from the way it is now. Uh, and I know that uh, some uh, in England there are some companies that have been prepared to work with the UK government uh, to have subsidised provision or even free provision in some cases. Well, we're not down that route at the moment here in Wales. And the minute we succeed in doing it for uh, to respond to the current crisis, we know that gives us an opportunity to do it longer term. So that uh, again, either at home or uh, in community hubs, there's an opportunity for um, blended learning to be a real thing for everybody at any time. At the moment, it's just an idea, isn't it? It's when, um, or when the community centers open, or if you can get to your local, I don't know, um, school on a wet Wednesday evening to do whatever course you're interested in. Uh, this It's one of those areas, Beth and said it, where COVID has given us the opportunity to do to learn about how we do things differently. And why are we talking about basic skills here, David? There's no reason why we can't use what we learn from that rollout, to use the good old uh, world government word, can't be used for all kinds of learning, including the higher level learning that um, we've been talking about a little bit. Um, so far. That will need resources and it'll need good relationships with um, the private sector bluntly uh, and you know that's something that Welsh Government the next one will have to consider how it does differently because that's not always been hugely successful. No I think that's an important point isn't it about the, the old first point there about um, this is also about how we how we support future generations and make sure they make sure we have more young people coming through the education system with the kind of the basic skills and essential skills they're going to need but also how we can enable them to, to update as well. Um, Heaven, I was going to come to you for that kind of the same question, really. Um, and I just kind of, uh, on on that, I mean, just, just a, a slight addendum to that as well, is around the the, the post-16 commission, you talked about your scepticism. Um, would you see, if, if you were going to do it, and there's going to be this rollout of potentially, rather, rather than a big leap, as you described it, would you see um, essential and basic skills as being one of the first things you would look at um, for, for a new commission or is this something you know would you start somewhere else with with a new commission if you weren't going to go for a big leap forward if you're going to stage approach potentially is our, our kind of essential and basic skills kind of part of that priority mix for you well this is Dave this is what I was referring to when I talked about a, a learning career um, and the fact that you know the, those basic skills are addressed um, at a point on that career ladder so if you're going to have a parity of esteem and, and, a, and a route through to, um, to, to, as I mentioned, high level apprenticeships, that starts somewhere and it starts at that basic, basic skills um, uh, journey at the very beginning. Um, and if you did have a single body, that would be part of the, the remit would be to ensure that all parts of the learning ladder are, are delivered and the learning career are delivered. Um, and, and I think that, that, as Susie said, that's where the challenge lies and it isn't a simple task. Um, I, I, I suppose I, what I should be doing here is defending what the Welsh Government have done uh, up until now to address some of these issues. And of course, they brought together um, under an employability programme, the uh, traineeships, REACT and Jobs Growth Wales into one programme uh, to develop that into an employability plan under um, a Leonard Morgan's uh, um, leadership. And I think that was a, a very real attempt to address those issues that you've already mentioned, Dave. The problem was it was introduced pre-pandemic. And the pre-pandemic has changed the landscape significantly, such that you need to revisit how you're going to achieve the targets. I mean, I'm just looking at some of the targets. Very clearly set out in the employability plan that Welsh Government published is this statement. We will reduce the number of people who are not in education and training in Wales, need in Wales. There are approximately 57,000 16 to 24 year olds in Wales who are not in education uh, or training. And I think that is, 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 the, is the holy grail. The problem with achieving that, it needs to be relevant to the circumstances you're currently operating within. And if you look at the employability plan, it talks about 
leaving the European Union, and it doesn't talk about coronavirus. So I think the response of the next government must put it into that context. Now, if you look at the, 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 the route to, to achieving that is, as we've all said, through community uh, bottom-up grassroots learning. And the Welsh Government set a target now to say, well, post-pandemic, and, and Beth and created a, a very vivid picture of the sister circumstances that reflect how difficult it is in communities at this point in time, but it won't always be that way. We are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, but the, what we've got to be able to do is build our grassroots learning at, as we emerge from the tunnel and do that quickly. And the challenge is, you know, what is our landscape going to look like? The Welsh Government has said, well, 30% of the workforce, we want to see 30% of the workforce working from communities, not working from home, but working from communities. Now, we, we're currently, as, as committee members, investigating what that really means and how that might be achieved. And as Susie says, it's not as easy as you think. But there will be opportunities for growth of community hubs in a way that perhaps we wouldn't have seen previously with the linear commute into Cardiff from communities that I represent. Um, so there is an opportunity there, not only to develop the world of work, but also develop the world of learning alongside that community-based um, uh, work that we see. And that gives us the opportunity to link learning into it. And, and those, those um, people leaving school, for example, will have the opportunity to link up with employers and, and, and workers in a way that they might not have had, um, certainly from my community, might not have had previously. So what that means then needs to be built into the employability plan. And at the moment, it isn't there. And it isn't there because everything's focused on COVID. So it's time now to revisit that and build into that, that vision that the Welsh Government has for 30% of the workforce working back in the communities. And I think that, that's the route towards that. Thanks, Evan. Yeah, I think that's right. And um, I think it should, I should probably put a shout out here because it's in the, in the chat coming on Slido to talk about the role of private education, uh, private training providers as well, um, obviously as part of that kind of mix. In well, terms of can the I, in that case, Dave, interrupt you there and say ACT and Caffelli have opened a hub and educate uh, uh, also based in Ashram Malak, which is just down the road here, um, have, have do excellent work in providing training and development in my community and they need to be supported. Yeah, I think it's that point as well, isn't it, about the different routes into excellence for individuals, that it's not just about one, one route or one other, there's multiple routes. I'm gonna look, uh, move to, uh, there are lots of questions around well-being, et cetera, and I think we've maybe answered some of those around that. I think perhaps the challenge is that is that balance between the in future about where, where the emphasis lies on skills for work, skills for well-being. I think that's in, maybe we'll come back to that um, for an, another session. But I just wonder, there's uh, one question here about a kind of scenario uh, for you as political leaders, that if there's one thing that you would introduce um, as the next Welsh Government, uh, and also one thing you would stop doing um, that the Welsh Government's currently doing, what would you choose? And I'm going to um, pick up... Um, I come to heaven first if I can. I come in reverse order. Sorry, heaven. So there's what the, the one thing you would introduce in the next Welsh government, and the one thing you would say to Welsh government you should stop doing. Oh God, there's so many things. Um, and also, don't forget, Dave. Remember what I said at the beginning. I'm not going to be in Welsh government. It's not going to be me. Uh, although I tell you something, we haven't actually got an education spokesperson at the moment. I've just realised. Uh, the like how and conservatives are the education people. We've got uh, Kirsty at the moment, Welsh government. I suppose Leonard has a role with lifelong learning, but you know, perhaps I'm appointing myself. Mark Drakeford doesn't know, uh, but I'm appointing myself as the education spokesperson. For me, everything comes back to this issue of uh, parity of esteem and and and, and this uh, career path, education and learning career pathway that puts the very basic beginnings of learning at the same level as the later uh, aspects of learning, but also uh, horizontally as well that different kinds of qualifications are valued in equal ways. And Susie put in the chat a comment that said, um, you know, professional qualifications are vocational ones, and absolutely right. And, and I think, you know, if I'm going to say, what, what is the underpinning principle that the next government needs to, needs to embrace in everything that they do, it's that issue of parity of esteem. And I don't think we are there yet. Um, you know, it's easy to say it, but we're not there yet. Um, so I think they, the, the Welsh government needs to stop assuming that by saying there's parity of esteem, there is parity of esteem, because there still isn't. And uh, that needs to be built into everything we do from teacher training, initial teacher training, uh, what we say to students, the culture we create in the classroom, um, through to university level and through through FE uh, and, 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 uh, and colleges too. So 
it's about creating that community of practice and and i don't think we're quite there yet and everyone on this call and i think there's a lot more people than i can see on this call everyone on this call has that role to play and i think when we talk about social partnership that's where it is that's where it's at and having access to uh, government is key and i've got to say kirsty has been very i don't know you may have different experiences but kirsty has appeared to me to be very accessible as a minister and I think that, I, I don't know, it, it appears that way. And I, I think that accessibility needs to continue um, and that policy that is developed needs to be listened to by the, by the sector. So that, that's kind of, you know, where, what we need to be doing and what we need to stop doing, if, if that does answer your question, Dave. Thanks, Evan. Um, come to Susie then for this one, the one thing you would introduce and the one thing you would stop doing. Uh, okay, yeah, it's a mean question, isn't it? Um, I think the thing that I would introduce, um, and I'm not sure how you would do this necessarily, but uh, is to breach this gap between um, employers and younger um, learners, if you like. Part of the problem is because we've got um, um, an SME culture, I suppose, and it's just very difficult for small businesses to feel that they've got influence. In, and I'm going down as far as schools here, um, but, the, but being as I've got in mind that shall we say, um, work-based learning and community providers are themselves part of the school system in CZ World, um, then just to give you a little bit of reassurance, I think that this space there for, uh, it's kind of what Heaven was talking about, is changing the culture within the school system. It has to be that early, I think, about what, what matters and what will matter to you as an individual, let alone as part of um, a wider community as a young learner. Uh, so we've got a couple of ways, which I'm, I'm not going to disclose here, but might even include things like tax incentives to see whether what we can do to make sure that employers understand that they're part of the solution of all Wales's education problems. Now, that's not the wicked old private sector just wading in and sort of being uh, throwing its weight around. It's just if we're, if we're after people who are going to be happy in the workplace in the future, then they need to have some sort of sense of what lies ahead of them. And that includes very, very specifically getting the innovators from HE in particular working in that same environment with employers, because at the moment there's a gap between brilliant ideas that we're seeing in Wales from all kinds of sources and um, uh, learners from all backgrounds would be prepared to take advantage of that and contributing to not only their own futures, but the future of Wales as well. Now, I know that sounds very high level, but there's a bit of work in the bit in the middle there that's not being done. And I don't think the uh, regional skills partnerships are quite, uh, ha haven't got what it takes to do that, um, as we found in the committee that we're work uh, working on. And in particular, this low skills trap, that pe this is the bit I would get rid of, is that the current apprenticeships, uh, the framework, in helps people stay in the low skills trap in my view which is um, what I mean by that is that while employers are prepared to engage with it they're not looking particularly to move people on they they don't see that they necessarily need higher skills in their work base uh, and uh, again that's a narrative that's under exploited at the moment I don't think enough businesses talent spot and that includes people that have come in perhaps through with the uh, basic skills from community um, settings I, I still think that employees just look at that individual and think, oh, well, you're that kind of person. That's the bit that needs to be stopped. And the, uh, there's some work that needs to be done then with regional skills partnerships or their successor um, to deal with that culture problem. Very difficult for governments to do, though, David, I'm sorry. No, no, I agree. But I think it's uh, one of the key challenges, isn't it, around yeah. the private sector and things. So, um, OK, Bethan. Um, one thing you would keep, uh, one thing you would introduce rather than one thing you get rid of? Well, gosh, it's so difficult, isn't it? Because there's so many things. I'm on my way out. I'm quite an aspirational person. I'm always told that sometimes I think to, um, yeah, too aspirational and it's not as realistic as all that. That's why some people say I'm not suited to politics. So I would stop the cuts that have happened in post-16 education since 2014 and prioritise it again. I think that's why we are having continuous discussions about parity of esteem, about what our education system looks like, because year after year after year, we've seen this sector 
failing in terms of what they can achieve because, and I'm not saying the, the sector are failing in how they do it, but failing to achieve its potential because of the way uh, that cuts have been implemented um, on further education. You know, I can tell you how many times I've gone into colleges when different sectors have been cut, when different language courses have been uh, totally eradicated from the offer. We have to reverse that in government if, if we become uh, part of the government next time because it simply uh, isn't uh, Acceptable. So that's what I would stop. Um, in terms of introducing, I would say I'd want to increase lecturers' pay, and I want to make sure that we have a um, parity between lecturers' pay and that of um, school teachers or those in school. Um, I talk to many people who say that they can't transition between further education um, and schools, and I think that should be allowed. I think why we don't have parity of steam is that, you know, if you can't transition, if you're told that some, somehow you're not good enough to teach in a school, then what does that say? for somebody if they want to change a career if they want to enhance their skills in life which means that they want a different place of work so i think we have to treat those in the sector with more respect um, and i think that comes with giving them the, the salary um, that they deserve um, and i would also um, in increase the minimum wage for apprentices in the first year many of those people who want to take part in apprentices are not doing so because um, it's very low in wage they don't see the benefit um, they can't uh, get um, onto the ladder for, for training and that really severely impacts uh, their life. So, you know, those are a few things that I would do. And, and, and the last thing I would do is, I know it's not one, but also I would say Plaid Cymru would come out with a few suggestions to try and um, encourage people to think about staying in Wales if they are leaving Wales for their courses and changing policies to, uh, to, to, to reflect that. I am all for universality and believe me, if I was in charge of the UK, I would just say, go wherever you want to study, it's fine. But we don't live in that ideal situation. And so I would want to be saying, well, how can we encourage our young people to stay? Are there ways we can give them incentives to at least come back after they leave Wales? I think we have to tackle that. That's the elephant in the room. Great, thank you, Bethan. Um, and I, 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 you would normally be getting rounds of applause now from our um, audience. Um, there's about 150 people watching this on Slido, our other platform from across the sector. So I will just, and they've been the ones posting the questions. So um, it's a massive thank I you. Did I more stand in then, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I want to thank all three of you um, uh, for your time and contribution today. Um, Susie and Bethan, especially for your kind of um, contributions i hope not the only con not, not the end of your contributions to to Welsh political life um but um thank you both of you for your support for learners uh in your time in the senate uh and thank you heaven uh, as well for representing partly the Welsh labor view but also partly i think the um constructive opposition from within the ranks um as well um so thank you ever so much and um we you know I, I'm, I'm sure the people watching on slider really appreciate your your comments a lot of questions came in i wasn't able to ask them all um, but I think there's some really valuable input there. So thank you ever so much. Can I just say, Dave, that the issue with this is that we can't see people's faces. So we don't know whether they're reacting positively or negatively to what we're saying. So it's, it's actually more frightening doing it this way than in front of everyone where you can see people are, are reacting. I'll, I'll tell you, everyone's been very positive. That's what politicians want to hear, isn't it? Just do a flat your egos. Now, there's, there's some really challenging questions there around how we get the balance right between skills and well-being. Um, and I think clearly we are going to need a fresh start. We're going to need to build on success, but also challenge ourselves with some new thinking, whatever party or parties are in government um, uh, after May. Um, we've won now. Uh, thank you again. So we've won now to um, our next panel. And I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague, Martin Walker, who's up in North Wales. Martin's one of the um, co-chairs of the Adult Community Learning Network here in Wales. And Martin's going to um, chair the final panel for our plenary session. Uh, today and I'll hand over to you Martin I'll leave you to introduce um, the speakers as well. Yeah, David. Um, Boris Darpaub, good morning and uh, good evening to some of our guest speakers today. Um, that was a, a fantastic conversation I thought and uh, provoked a lot of thought for the future. So where next after the pandemic and what have we learned? So today, Rob Humphreys, uh, who's the poly, uh, interim chair for higher education funding for Council for Wales, is going to share some of his thoughts. 
There will be an opportunity to ask questions and they will come through on the chat. So please post your questions as Rob and the other guests are speaking. And then we'll come to the questions at the end. Rob? Uh, thanks very much, Martin. Uh, good, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day, everyone. Uh, it's lovely to be with you and great once again to be at an event organised by the excellent Learning and Work Institute, Cymru. Uh, Martin said that mentioned that I am the interim chair of the Higher Education Funding Council for Wales. Uh, I should say as a caveat that uh, my remarks this morning are given in a, a personal capacity. The uh, Hefku Thought Police may get after me if I um, go off message from a higher education point of view. Uh, and uh, the previous speakers, uh, the Minister Susie Davis, uh, Heaven David and Bethan Said, all came up with some very interesting and challenging ideas. And uh, I will touch on um, many of those in what I've got to say, but I can't name check whoever's already raised them, so apologies for that in advance. What I'd like to do is first of all, just uh, very briefly touch on some key elements of the economic and social fallout um, after COVID, in particular, the disproportionate effects on different parts of Wales's economy and society. And then I wanna go on to address where we are now as uh, an adult education uh, group of sectors, both the risks, challenges, but also some opportunities. But before I do any of that, I think it's worth reminding ourselves, as if we need reminding, that COVID occurred in an existing context. Before COVID, in Wales, we had an underperforming economy. Uh, we were still dealing with deindustrialization from the 1980s. Anyone who's uh, worked abroad, I've spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia in the last uh, year or two, uh, pre-pandemic, uh, talking with uh, practitioners in higher education and indeed uh, the government in Vietnam, they talk incessantly about industrial, the Industrial Revolution 4.0. In Wales, we are still dealing with the after effects of the Industrial Revolution 2.0. Uh, the challenge is immense for us still. And of course, those effects are spatially defined. They affect some parts of Wales far more than others. And as a consequence, we have low productivity in the economy. We have some very serious and deep-seated uh, basic skills and literacy challenges. And there's been a decline in provision in adult education and part-time learning, not since 2011, as somebody said, but in, in fact, for the last 15 or almost 20 years, there are some signs that the trend has been bucked in higher education after the Diamond Review, but those are green shoots only, I think, rather than a new, uh, new terrain and vista altogether. And then finally, in terms of thinking about the context, I'm sorry to raise this, everyone, but we are still facing the after effects of Brexit. And those effects, at least in the short to medium term, are going to be some serious shocks to the economy and also to our wider culture, it seems to me. So where does this leave us? Uh, where are we left after COVID as and when the pandemic uh, comes to an end? We'll be rather like pit ponies emerging from a coal mine after many, many months of working in the dark. The economy will be bruised and our society will be seriously bruised, both collectively and as individuals. We know that COVID has exposed and in some cases accelerated trends which were already there in our society. Perhaps the, the, the most obvious one is the decline of the high street and the, and the uh, change in retail uh, habits and so on. But it will also show that SMEs will probably be even more important than they were before to the Welsh economy. Um, we had much talk about valuing of different groups of workers, those in health and social care, most obviously, but also those who work in delivery, supermarket, the food supply chain and so on. It's quite intriguing to me as uh, to, to uh, consider how that debate about valuing different sectors, particularly people in low paid work, was a, a major feature of the early lockdowns, but that has really subsided now, that sentiment, it seems to me. And uh, 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 we've almost forgotten collectively about what, what we were saying about those uh, different groups who should be valued more highly. 
And significantly, there will be a huge shakedown in our labour markets, uh, particularly once the furlough scheme comes to an end. And that may well or is likely to have a disproportionate effect on women, uh, young people, and to some extent on uh, young graduates who, graduates who enter the labour market in the last two or three years, or those who are about to enter the labour market. Then finally, two aspects of the pandemic, uh, which we've um, really got to uh, consider very, very seriously, given the, the subject matter of our conference today. Funding for adult education is, is likely to come under even greater pressure, not least because EU funding of much of that provision will come to an end in the next uh, year or so. And secondly, we know that the use of the internet and events like this have been a major benefit of the um, pandemic. It's a new experience for many. People have seen the potential, as Sri Anand said at the very start of the conference this morning, huge potential of that for learning and for social connectedness. Uh, but there are also some challenges around that, it seems to me, and I'll come back to that later. It's rather like the debate of about working from home. Uh, there are many, many benefits of that, but in some cases, it's an example of uh, middle-class people projecting their own benefits onto wider society. Those with many rooms in their house uh, are free to join meetings without leaving the home and bake the sourdough at the same time. Not everybody has the capacity domestically or the, um, uh, the wherewithal, the financial wherewithal to pay for broadband and so on in order to enjoy those benefits. So where does this leave us in terms of real challenges and indeed risks to adult education? I mentioned earlier on, there's like, uh, earlier on just now, that there's likely to be a major funding squeeze and the decline in EU funding is going to be a serious effect on our provision. Secondly, there is a, a significant debate around levelling up the economy at UK level. Now, it's uh, difficult to see how that levelling up agenda is going to bring the same equivalent amount of EU funding that we've been benefited, benefited from in Wales into Wales. It will also almost certainly uh, comprise a major drive towards skills only forms of adult, adult education. Thirdly, I think there's going to be an immense focus on young people in the labour market, to a large extent, rightly so. However, that may crowd out uh, what should be offered, what might be offered for older people in the labour market. And in Wales, we have experience in our own lifetime, some of us, of a whole swathe, almost a whole generation of older people been effectively parked out of the labour market. This happened after the major deindustrialization in the 1980s, when large numbers of older people, particularly in the older industrial areas, such as the South Wales Coalfield, were effectively removed from the labour market and parked outside of it and didn't even count in unemployment statistics. A further challenge for us is if SMEs become more significant in our economy, we know that historically they found it difficult to engage with colleges and training providers. So we have to find new ways of engaging uh, that uh, pivotal part of the um, economy. And then we know that COVID has exposed a digital divide. And that in itself is an Achilles heel of all the, uh, 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 amidst all the euphoria about blended learning and the use of Zoom and Teams and all the rest of it. And Learning and Work's own research shows that there are significant needs and challenges uh, in that particular area. However, it's not all doom and gloom, it seems to me. And as a number of the uh, MSs have uh, remarked this morning, this is a major opportunity to reset the dial in terms of uh, thinking what adult education is for, uh, how it might best be configured, and so on. So in what ways might we do that? And I'm not going to touch on a few uh, relatively random ideas here. First of all, 
I think we need to find creative ways of incentivizing participation in adult learning. And I think it was Susie Davis that mentioned we might think creatively about using the taxation system in Wales. We haven't really uh, been imaginative collectively in Wales yet about how we might use the, the relatively new tax varying powers of the Senedd in an innovative way in this territory or indeed in, other, in any other territories. Secondly, providers will surely need to develop shorter and more flexible courses with new forms of credit. Courses which will range right from basic skills up to courses for relatively new graduates. There will be many graduates, whether they're new or people who have had long-standing careers, who may well find themselves out of work now. We have to find new, accessible, creative, flexible ways of meeting their needs. The diamond reforms in higher education go some way to uh, pointing uh, the way forward in that area, but the full diamond recommendations in this territory uh, were not actually implemented by government, so that is work worth another look, it seems to me. Then we also need to explore how we can secure a more balanced form of lifelong learning provision. Balance between basic skills needs and higher level provision, balance between skills needs and the wider benefits of learning, inc including cultural dimensions of learning, and balance between online learning and face-to-face -face learning. It seems to me that, uh, face -to -face, that those who want to write the obituary of face-to-face -face learning are wrong in terms of uh, what the actual demand may be out there. I still think there is huge value in the simple conviviality of meeting people face-to-face to study. Then in addition to this, providers will have to show greater fleetness of foot. Uh, many providers in FE and HE would say they're already fleet of foot. I think that's certainly the case uh, to some extent in the case of FE, but I think both sectors and private providers and other forms of providers will have to be quicker to respond now to meet citizen demand, employer demand, and indeed what the governments want them to do. But there are big opportunities here in terms of FE providers and HE providers in particular being anchor institutions in their communities and contributing to the foundational, foundational economy. Now I'll finish now with uh, four or five uh, what I might call more concrete uh, recommendations. I'm a supporter, not uh, an unqualified supporter, but a supporter of the joint commission proposals that, that exist in the draft bill at the moment for the Commission for Tertiary Education Research, the CETA reforms, which the Minister referred to this morning. I'm a supporter, but not, not, not an unqualified supporter. I think there's some challenges with the way the existing bill, draft bill is worded. But I think a key task of the new commission, should it exist, or it is something that could take place before the commission is established, we need an inquiry into lifelong learning which seeks to join the dots and find the gaps and secure best value from the various uh, providers and forms of provision that exist at the moment. It's far too much of a patchwork quality at present and we need to find ways of uh, securing provision which is spatially even across Wales but also addresses the new and emerging needs that will exist after um, COVID. Secondly, we need more research into concrete empirical research into the quality of our adult learning provision and how learners themselves see it. So in particular, the euphoria I described earlier on about blended learning and the use of Zoom and so on, much of that is anecdotal. We don't actually know uh, who gets a lot out of it, uh, are there problems with some aspect of that provision? Who is it missing out? Who does it turn off? Uh, and so on. How well have providers adapted? Have they adapted consistently across different subjects and disciplines and so on? We urgently need research on that before policymakers race off into investments in this area without taking stock of the actual experience of learners. We also need to build up build out from the idea of the right to lifelong learning. 
or lifetime allowance as one or two of the other uh, MSs have described it, and see how that fits into the notion of civic engagement of institutions. I think we've got to step up as a sector, if I can use that term, to help rather than sit on the sidelines uh, uh, and invite politicians to fill the space themselves. We have the expertise. So the right to lifelong learning, which is something that the present minister uh, put onto the table maybe two years ago, and she conceded, I think, that to some extent it hadn't been blown off course, it had been slowed down by the pandemic. I think that's entirely understandable. But we need to step up and step in and flesh out that idea and that concept to make it affordable and practicable and implementable. And then finally, I think we should be more assertive in the area of um, adult community learning and make simple demands, requests, such as how about doubling or even trebling the ACL budget? It's minuscule as a component of Welsh government expenditure as a whole. And in meeting the some of the cultural repercussions of COVID, the societal and cultural repercussions, and indeed in addressing some of the cultural divides which were exposed and accentuated by Brexit, ACL, which has always been the poor relation, has a very, very important role to play. And finally, perhaps in thinking about a post-COVID Wales and a post-COVID world, thinking about running things differently as a society, exploring new ways and new, uh, new prioritizations of society, perhaps adult learning has a role itself in stimulating debate in that particular area, just as debates around the beverage reforms in the middle of World War II from 1942 onwards, debates around those beverage reforms, which were conducted through adult education, particularly armed, uh, in the armed forces, led to major significant social reform after 1945. I think that in itself is a huge opportunity for adult learning, and it's for it for us to seize that opportunity. Thank you, Rob. Uh, definitely lots of food for thought there. I'm sure colleagues across Wales will um, concur when I say um, learning online is not all it's cracked up to be for a lot of learners, and they can't wait to get back to face-to-face -to -face, um, classes. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Susan, Susan Pember, who is the uh, Policy Director for HOLEX, which is the lead professional body for adult education and learning. Susan. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm going to carry on where Rob sort of left off, really. Um, I think everybody in England, and Wales and Scotland and Ireland now need to be really ambitious about adult education and just ask for £7 billion more annually. I'll say that again, £7 billion annually. Um, and it sounds a big sum, but when you think of where money's gone over the last two years, I think we're getting used to hearing these big numbers. And the only way we're ever going to sort of level up, if we want to use that expression in this country, um, is without having a big influx of money. And I don't think we should be ashamed about that. And why I say that, we've done some work looking at um, you know, what, what, what are the needs of adults um, post-Brexit and now post-Covid. And we've, all, we've still got all those legacy issues that we had before COVID. You know, we've still got poor basic skills in this country. Um, we've still got um, an aging population that has to work. Um, we're not gonna be able to retire till we're 70 plus. Um, so we need to work and we need to be retrained in later life. We've still got the rising threat. Everybody says it's a threat of automation, but it actually could be, um, you know, a really helpful um, way, to, way into new jobs in, in new sectors. Um, we've also got the issue of um, you know, developing our own after Brexit, which Rob sort of talked about. And um, we've got this gig economy. So we talk about employers all the time, but about 20% of our workers these days uh, haven't got an employer. They haven't got somebody in the driving seat. You know, they are in that driving seat themselves. And, and what, we, what we don't have um, anywhere, I think, in, in the United Kingdom is a, a really clear narrative um, so, you know, if you if you look at Wales and Scotland, you're more likely to have a bit of a policy 
um, for adult education, post-16 education, than we are in England. In England, we got um, a myriad of different initiatives. Um, but I should say that we do have some new money. So um, we, we, we've got a, a set budget of 1.3 billion, and the government is, is putting around 700 million more in annually. Um, but when you think we're 40% less than we were in 2011, it isn't probably... Um, uh, a sort of uh, 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 as much as we, we need or, or require. And then on top of that, we've got COVID. And what have we found out from COVID? Well, uh, you know, we found that people have gone online, um, but what type of person has gone online to do their learning? Um, well, it's first of all, is the person who's got digital access, the person who's got a laptop, is the person who's not only got one laptop, they've also got a couple of spare ones for their children to do their online learning. Um, and what new research is beginning to show that, yes, people have gone online to do something. Um, that thing hasn't turned into any form of qualifications often, other than those who are in sort of mainstream education, in higher education or, or in school. And um, that bit of learning ha has been in, in very interesting subject areas, which I think we should sort of um, begin to um, uphold as, uh, as a way forward. Because when people are left to their own devices, what do they look for? They look for the crafts, they look for literature, they look for book clubs, they look for um, doing um, something, uh, as um, Rob was saying, about making sour bread. Um, and, and they feel good about that. And I think that leads us then back to adult education. We sometimes apologetic about that we have a system in this country that allows people to do something that isn't obviously skills based. But if we look at sort of um, um, Rhiannon's story, her, her wanting to learn Welsh led to lots of um, her, her learning new skills in jewellery and things like that. Um, so back, so what have we learned about post-COVID? Well, we've learned we've still got our legacy issues. We've still got then um, new issues coming out of COVID because when you look at the people who have done something online, they are the people who normally, who have already got qualifications. So those who were um, excluded from education before COVID are still excluded. Um, and it isn't just because of digital, it's because often they didn't have the basic skills um, to be able to um, access it, even if they had the kit. And that is one of the issues I think we're going to have to work hard about. How do we get those people back to learning? And when we look at the stats um, in England, we can see it is that person from an ethnic background um, who is low skilled, who has not done any learning, whether it's online or whether, whether they've been centres open when we've had the unlockdowns, um, whether they've been able to go in for learning, they haven't taken it up. So what do we need to do for the future? Well, um, I'm a bit wary of big um, planning organisations. Um, you know, in, in England, we've had the lot, you know, the Learning and Skills Council, Sector Skills Councils, the LEPs. Um, you know, we, we've had so many different regional structures um, that I'm always wary of large planning organisations because we're often, uh, always, always, I'm absolutely confident to say the word always, what always gets lost is the pre-entry, the level one and the basic skills learner. And at the moment, I've also put the level two learner in that because I feel there is a, a push in England to maybe say well, we actually don't need level two. We can get people for a basic year and then they can sort of jump into a level three. So when we look to the future, um, you know, where I've been looking around the world is where people have been successful of doing basic skills. And it really is a local level. And I'm talking about street level. You're looking for an infrastructure where somebody can actually point to that family and um, that group of individuals who are not in learning, they're in low skills, and then they need intermediaries to help them into learning. So one of the different ways of doing the um, restructuring, um, if we, we feel we all feel we do need to restructure, is to say, right, everything from level three upwards, um, you know, is for colleges, it's technical, it's vocational, it needs high tech, it needs to be in a very technical um, environment, and you may need to travel to get that expertise. Um, for everything else, everything that's about 
basic skills pre-entry um you know it's about the sort of the the 40 percent who haven't got a level two what they need is some local structures local structures that allow them to access training and that could be um you know within a community hall it could be within you know the 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 supermarket's own training hall room that they're willing to give free to a provider but it needs to be local and it needs to be where people can join up services so what i'm talking about there you know if in the local authority you've already got um, a group of officers working on vulnerable families then they need to be talking to the people who are providing adult education so that collectively that you're working with that particular family and we need to revise things like family learning um you know if, if family learning had been operating around the country pre-covid everywhere then covid for many families would have been easier because those families would have had the skills to help their children learn and, and lastly um for me uh, we talk about um you know adult learning adult education adult skills and um, what i want people to be remind each other of is that it's all about the individual it doesn't really matter in the end what government says or what the employer says if the individual doesn't want to learn something um then it's not going to be that successful so motivating individuals to learn is going to be incredibly important to the future and rebalancing where we put the public pound um, into the low level activity is going to be um, the second thing on my list. And the third thing on my list is about building that very local infrastructure and making sure that we prioritize the people who feel neglected. I think it's probably the right word, neglected by society. They see it, you know, funding and uh, activity and focus often being level three, level four degrees, which isn't their world. So we need a new focus and a new language all about the level one pre-entry and level two learner. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Definitely um, lots of food for thought there as well, um, especially I think the community aspect will need rebuilding after post-COVID and, and building that trust again with our partners in the community. There is. I'd like to welcome now or say good evening to Colin, who's uh, joins us from New Zealand. And uh, Colin is the Director of Adult Community, Adult community Education. And now, correct me if I'm wrong in pronouncing this, Colin, it's Awatiora. Awatiora. Uh, okay, thank you. Close. Okay. Right. Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Colin McGregor toka ingwa, ko Benahi toka manga, ko the Don te awa, ko Aberdeen aho, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Greetings to you all. My name is Colin McGregor and I'm the Director of Adult and Community Education, Aotearoa. We are the peak body for the ACE sector in New Zealand. What I'm going to do is give a brief overview of New Zealand, then outline the nature of the adult learning sector in New Zealand and the adult learning role in supporting well-being. New Zealand Aotearoa has about a 10% bigger land mass than the United Kingdom, with a population about the size of Scotland, that's about 5 million. New Zealand was first settled by Maori and then colonised by the English. It's unique in terms of having a treaty with Maori, which has led to a mechanism to address past injustices. The population breakdown is about 70% European, 16% Maori, 15% Asian, and 9% Pacific Island. Um, Auckland City is also the largest Pacific Island city in the world. Uh, we have a history of stable government, which operates through the Westminster model. Although generally considered a very tolerant society, uh, we were traumatised by terrorists from Australia who attacked two mosques in Christchurch in 2019, where 51 people were killed. We have a Labour government, first elected in 2017 and re-elected in 2020, with the largest majority of any government in New Zealand since proportional representation was um, introduced in 1996. And of course, you will know we are very ably led by the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern who has been pivotal in managing the very successful uh, to date response to COVID-19. Um, as of today, we've had a total of 26 COVID related deaths with 2,267 cases, which is uh, remarkable. 
Even our recent outbreak last week was well contained with an immediate Auckland lockdown and a nationwide increase in our COVID level limitations. New Zealand's remain committed to the task. In our case, this has meant the cancellation of our annual Maori and Pacifica gathering. Where we had 200 participants registered in the space of 24 hours. Um, in the space of 24 hours, we communicated, communicated the decision and refunded the people the registrations. The feedback we have received is, was one of sadness of the cancellation, but support of the decision and how it was handled. The adult learning sector in New Zealand. We have about 600 organisations delivering ACE to around about 73,000 learners. ACE courses include those focused on personal enrichment, foundation learning, cultural and professional vocational enrichment. Many of these organisations are supported by government funding to deliver specific courses related to foundation learning and vocational enrichment. Others uh, are learners funded or supported by philanthropic, philanthropic trusts. Uh, these organisations are, are supported by us, um, ACE Aotearoa, which have developed teaching standards, quality assurance mechanisms, learner pathways and an outcomes measurement tool. ACE Aotearoa is funded by government to provide these services to its members and ACE organisations in general. Um, and that's proved very successful in terms of developing and supporting the sector. The adult learning role in supporting wellbeing. Since the election of a Labour government, there have been a number of strategic initiatives that have boosted the ACE sector. Firstly, New Zealand is blessed in that we are one of the countries like Iceland and Canada who have a wellbeing focus to the budget. This means a focus on people being able to lead fulfilling lives with purpose, balance, and meaning to them. In real terms, this means taking mental health seriously, improving child wellbeing, supporting Maori and Pacifica aspirations, building up a productive nation, and transforming the economy. Secondly, government has been working with the ACE sector to redesign ACE policy and where it sits in the tertiary education system. Thirdly, the government has released a tertiary education strategy, which for the first time acknowledges the role of the ACE sector. And finally, and most positively for the adult learning sector in New Zealand, uh, last year we received a $12 million boost to um, the funding. This is the first additional investment to our sector in over 10 years. This investment is directed supporting um, ACE RTRO as the lead agency and supporting a range of new initiatives to support wellbeing. The ACE sector has worked hard to provide data to government on impact of ACE courses. An outcome tool is in place which measures progress of learners on courses, in particular in raising confidence levels and hopes for the future. Many of the courses don't lead to qualifications, they lead to a pathway for qualifications. We think this data has assisted government thinking in provision of more funding. In particular, this government is encouraging our school-based night classes, which were significantly reduced in 2010. Um, in 2010, we had 400 schools providing classes. It was down to 27 last year. The theory is behind this is to build community resilience through engagement of adults in a range of accessible courses. In addition, specific funding was allocated to the role of adult learning can play in supporting wellbeing. As well as improving employability, promoting social and cultural inclusion, this includes the Maori language, um, and raising foundation schools, the government has included new criteria for funding called improving health and well-being. This new area will, will focus on uh, courses on resilience, conflict management, parenting schools, anger management, uh, and generally well-being courses. The government views adult and community education as playing an important role in the current climate. There's an alignment from the wellbeing focus on the country to funding support for wellbeing in the community. So it comes all the way down. As you can imagine, schools have responded positively to this wellbeing focus with the introduction of courses to support the initiative. In addition, um, initial indications are that take up of courses are much higher than in previous years. In one case, enrollments up over 50% in the same period in 2020. Schools and other community providers are also well set up to provide online courses, as others have discussed. Uh, during our severe lockdown 2020, the sector quickly adapted courses to online provision. There remains disparity between those who have access to, to devices and the internet, as also has been discussed today. 
Uh, this is an issue that is yet to be resolved. Beyond the importance of government that recognises the value of ACE, there are three key takeouts for us. Firstly, this government likes data. The ability to show that adult and community education has an impact has been critical to our success. Secondly, COVID-19 has shown the importance of connection. ACE has always had a critical role in maintaining community wellbeing through access to learning, which encourages support and communication. And finally, and this has also been touched on by other speakers, the importance of flexibility. Flexibility of government to fund a wide range of courses in the future and the flexibility of ACE providers to respond. To conclude, in New Zealand we have the saying, hi aha te mea nui o te ao, maku e keatu, hi tangata, hi tangata, hi tangata. What is the most important thing in the world? It is people, it is people, it is people. I am privileged to live in a country where our actions reflect the same. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Um, some fantastic ideas there. I, I really like the pathways model that you've introduced over there. Uh, I think that's uh, food for thought for uh, the network across Wales. It is. Thank you. Uh, our last speaker then um, is uh, Graciela Sabatioli. Um, and uh, Graciela is the Secretary General of the European Basic Skills Network. So over to you. Thank you very much. And Bode uh, Da, if it is right. Uh, actually, having heard you speak in, in Welsh and having heard uh, uh, Maori, I should say, Bon dia y bona tarde, and that is Catalan, which is actually my mother language, even though I'm greeting you from Norway. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I have been listening to everybody and learning a lot about Wales and uh, uh, identifying with many of your opinions. It is very interesting. I will start by, uh, are you seeing my PowerPoint? Yeah, good. I, I thought it would be a good idea to have something, it's just to remind me of what I want to say. Um, I will, would like to tell you a little bit about the network that I represent, the European Basic Skills Network. is a policy level network, but what is a little bit uh, unique about us is that we have both the policy makers and the policy providers in the network. Uh, policymakers will be, there are several ministries of education, there are uh, national governmental organizations, and then there are the policy providers as, for instance, lear learning and work. Uh, one of our founding members, if I can say that, um, who do the research or there are also associations of teachers or there are umbrella organizations for NGOs in several countries. So it's uh, everybody who is working on basic skills at two different levels. And we think that that gives us uh, a, a special capacity to achieve our goal, which is to promote excellence in policy design and policy, policy implementation for the basic skills that we deal mostly with, which is literacy, numeracy, digital skills, and what you call ESOL, second language for immigrants. We are at the moment 83 members, and we also have associated members outside Europe just to, to exchange experiences. We cooperate with the Commission specifically for upskilling pathways for the agenda projects. We cooperate with several countries uh, trying to develop uh, their policy. And we are also very active in EPALE with what we call the capacity building series, which I will tell you a little bit more about later. Um, our focus, and I, I noticed that we agree on this, on the incredibly, incredible importance of basic skills. And our base in research is, is the results from PIAC, where it's obvious that one in five European adults don't have the functional levels uh, they need. Um, 
thinking of what uh, you were asked, some of you, what you would like to change, what you would like to stop doing, I think we need to stop thinking that the person that can read a text aloud and well enough for you to understand is a person who can read. That person may have a very low level of functional literacy, maybe reading something and not understanding it because he's just concentrating on the fact of reading and reading has not become automatized. And that is a problem we have all over Europe. So um, thinking of the COVID uh, era and the post COVID era, uh, at the EBSN, we think we uh, were a bit lucky because we had already chosen two or three years ago to have a very clear focus on the issue of basic skills as transversal skills, skills that are not only important for your education, but are important for your employability, for your inclusion, for, for your health, for your welfare, there are so many areas that need to be involved also at governmental level. And that's thinking of what you have been uh, discussing now, whether there should be one agency or if I understood it right. Um, I agree with those of you who are a bit skeptical, but maybe for another reason. Uh, if, if you put everything in education, in one agency, you will create cohesion between the different levels, but you're leaving outside of the agency all these areas that also need to be involved. Stakeholder cooperation needs to be much, much wider than we have had till now. And that is why we have created in the network, in cooperation with the PALE, um, a whole series of open educational resources aimed at policymakers who are outside the educational sector. What, what does a person working in the employment area, area need to know about the low levels of basic skills of many people in our target group? So uh, that is what we call the capacity building series. And we, I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, that if I get the time. But uh, the important issues in basic skills policy in Europe today are relevance, flexibility, life-wide learning, and le learner-centered approaches. And I know that we agree on this because one of the things that we are really promoting, um, examples of good practice at European level, is the learning and works citizen curriculum. I have heard it's not very used in, in Wales. I would encourage you to look at that model again, because it does tick many of the boxes of what I just said. Relevance, flexibility, life-wide, learner-centered. The COVID era has put digital skills really on the focus. It is both a target for learning and a tool we can use. I'm not sure I really agree with some of the comments that I have heard today about uh, who has been using um, online learning and which groups. I think the picture is very varied. Uh, I don't know about Wales, but what I know, I, I live in Norway and I know that uh, some groups that had already started their learning at very, very low level, even an alphabet uh, immigrants who were just learning oral Norwegian at the beginning and had just barely started to write it, they actually managed to keep in touch with each other and with the teacher during lockdown by mobile phones and short messages on SMSs. The, the level of the learner, I, there's, there's not enough research about this as yet. We will have to study it. 
but the impression we get talking to people in the field is that the really uh, decisive element is not the level of learning, the, the level of skills of the learner, but the capacity of the teacher, the vision of the teacher, the didactic knowledge on how to use and, and the creativity, obviously. Uh, so it is possible, and I think that we will go on doing this sort of learning in the post-COVID era, but there are many things to look at in this new paradigm. Um, functional skills in digital skills, for instance, uh, will keep advancing. The, one of the problems we have with basic skills is that they are a moving target. The level of literacy you needed 20 years ago is not the level of literacy you need today. And thinking also about what I have heard today, I agree that uh, a big part of the problem will disappear if we manage to teach the youngsters a good level of, uh, of literacy while they are at school. But it's not going to disappear completely because there is erosion. Some of these young people have a, a feeling of failure about schooling, will not go back to studying if they can avoid it. They will not read if they can avoid it. And, and then it actually erodes. So you will have people who 20 or 30 years after they left school have a lower level of basic skills than what they had when they left school. So the, the problem is here to stay, I'm afraid. But let's go back to, to these, uh, these ideas about the COVID and the post-COVID era. The preliminary findings, we all agree that it, it has confirmed the gap between the haves and the haves not, have nots in, in education. Uh, the lower the level of education, the harder it has been for people to, to thrive and survive. And the importance of literacy for health literacy the importance of having a, a critical understanding of fake news, for instance, has been obvious. And yes, it has impacted harder on the people that have low levels of education than on others. That is, it's beginning to be obvious. On the other hand, we have been thrown into the digital arena and some teachers were prepared, some teachers were not. Can digital tools be used for all target groups? As I told you before uh, a moment ago, actually the answer is yes, if you know how to. So what we need to do now to prepare for this may happen again and again and again. So we need to prepare for the possibility of further pandemic periods and also to be able to use blended learning, we need to start planning what do teachers need to know? What tools should be available? What are, the, as somebody mentioned before, the, the problems of infrastructure, of, of uh, all the, 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 the structure that needs to be there if we are going to use online learning. But, Blended learning is something we need to embrace and study how to do it in the right way. Um, the flipped school, the need to, to really flip out, <laughs> I think is something we need to consider very carefully because uh, I thoroughly agree that there's nothing like meeting people to learn around the table with a good teacher and have the social uh, aspect of it. But there's a lot of learning that can be done outside that space so that you use the teacher for what only the teacher can do. The emotional aspect, the motivational aspect, the seeing the individual, which a, a computer doesn't do, but use both uh, aspects of the flipped learning, of blended learning in a good way 
to do that, we need to prepare the teachers and we need to prepare ourselves. There isn't enough understanding yet of what type of tool you should be using for what type of activity with what type of target group, with what type of teacher, what suits you, your subject and the teachers. There's so much to study. So we need to create communities of practice and flexible provision for the teachers and start working on what, on, on how to really uh, create this type of blended learning. I told you that we in the EBSN have been working with the capacity building series, which you can find in a ballet, which is mostly for policymakers and it's information about different issues in basic skills. We have just started a new project financed by the Commission. It's an Erasmus Plus uh, project on professional development of teachers. So there will be OER collections, uh, just information on, on the web, on Nepal, and then we will create uh, courses, MOOCs, based on those collections. We will be working on how to uh, design and implement good blended learning for adults who need basic skills provision. And the, I forgot to say that the EBSN is actually not as network financed by the Commission. We are independent. So uh, post Brexit, UK is very, very welcome to be, uh, to continue being a very important part of our network. And we welcome new institutions if you're interested. And please do get in touch with us if you want to pilot some of our courses when uh, this project has advanced more, more, or if you have news for us or input about examples of good practice. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> um, we have some questions, um, but please do keep them coming through. Um, first question for probably for Rob and Susan, really. The idea of an inquiry for adult learning, how we join up all aspects of learning for adults and have a clear strategy for the whole approach, including pre-entry. How do you see that developing? Um, Rob, do you want to go first? Me? Yeah. Well, um, it, it's a feature of Welsh public policy of the last, well, since devolution, in fact, um, that the government has set up a series, in a number of areas, a series of arm's length independent reviews or inquiries into various aspects of policy. And I, I myself have sat on two independent reviews on uh, higher education, its funding and structure. Uh, more recently, I've been a member of uh, an independent review at UK level on further education. Uh, and generally, they lead to positive and beneficial policy change, uh, not least because they bring a focus and, uh, onto the, the issue uh, in question, and they invite input from stakeholders right, right across the board, you know, from opposition parties through to providers, learners, citizens, consumers, wherever they might be. Um, but we've never had one on adult learning. And one of the, the, the problems, uh, the structural challenges of adult learning in Wales is that it is very fragmented. Um, and although the Learning and Work Institute does a terrific job in knitting that together, uh, like today's event, um, each component part is very small compared, say, to the higher education sector or further education sector as a whole. And I think um, an inquiry into what works, what needs to change, how things can be joined up uh, better, what are the actual needs, particularly post pandemic, uh, would be of real value. And I'd encourage a new minister, whoever that is, to establish one of those uh, on day one or day two of coming into office and say, produce a report for me, evidence-based report in nine months to a year and then we'll see what we can do. Thank you, Rob. Susan? 
Yeah, um, I mean, it's interesting. Last year, um, both um, for the whole, you know, the UK, we had, I think, seven, if not eight um, commissions or reviews on lifelong learning. So every political party did one. Um, the 100 year on commission did one. And um, we had two lots of uh, policy um, groups like the Centre of Social Justice did one. So we're not short of recommendations of what should be in a lifelong learning um, strategy. But what we are short of is some collective understanding about what we mean when we say that. Because when you looked at the recommendations from those reviews, um, some of them had, you know, should we have an account? Um, so that was about incentivizing people into learning. But hardly any of them joined up all the different aspects that I think we as practitioners, I can still put myself into that group, um, see. Um, so there's things like, uh, you know, in England now, we just had a new FE white paper called, the title is brilliant, by the way, right? Skills for Jobs for Lifelong Learning for Opportunity and Growth. So actually, it's got lifelong learning in the title, um, it's got opportunity in the title, and it's got growth in the title. Uh, but when you get into the document, it really isn't joined up with DWP, it's not joined up with health, um, it hasn't really understood, you know, the arts um, aspect of lifelong learning or the well-being aspect. So, again, it's a sort of half a narrative. And I think that's what I'm looking for, whether it be in Wales or in England, is that we have a joined up story that everybody gets behind, that it's signed off not just by the Department for Education, but also by local government, by DWP and by health. Um, and also, you know, is underpinned then with a proper strategy on literacy and numeracy, a proper strategy of where we learn in the community and a proper strategy on ESOL. Um, and if I had that, I'd be a really happy person. That's great. Thank you, Susan. Um, a question for Colin. Um, the uh, aspect of well-being that's fully recognised by the government in New Zealand, has that increased the voice of ACE in, in New Zealand and made it a stronger participant? Absolutely. Um, the additional funding has also helped, obviously, but the fact that we can provide um, courses on psychological well-being, um, well-being for women, um, even things such as um, mindfulness has increased the um, marketability of ACE and the uh, yeah the openness of, to ACE to the community that, that is out there, they're aware of it and they're willing to, to join courses. Yep. That's great. Thank you, Colin. Um, a final observation for me, really. Um, there's been lots of talk today really about uh, skills and employability. Uh, and it's interesting, Rob has mentioned that we need a greater focus on um, joining things together. Um, and it, it's really about well-being and everything and joining all those dots together, really. Um, it would be nice to see a change in policy from uh, the, whichever government comes into in May uh, and that ACL is recognised fully. It's like Rob said, we have been the poor relation for a long, long time. And it's interesting that Susan says we should ask for seven billion. That would be, go down a treat, I think. So thank you all for your participation today and thank you uh, for your contributions and, and for your thoughts. Thank you. Over to you, David. Thanks, Martin. And um, thank you to all the speakers there. And I thought um, it was a really interesting panel discussion. I don't think we've ever had Welsh, Catalan and Maori, I think, spoken in one, um, in one session. But I really appreciate all your time. And this is one of the great things about doing conferences this way. Although we lose a networking, we lose that in-person contact, we're able, I think, to draw from a much wider and richer source of, um, of speakers. Um, I do want to give particular thanks to Colin because it is ridiculously early in the morning for Colin in the middle of the night over there in New Zealand. Um, but we're very, very grateful for staying up. I don't know if you stayed up or gone to bed and got back up again, I'm not sure, but we are very, very grateful for your time. Um, very envious as well of what's happening in New Zealand at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think lots of lessons for us around the pandemic and adult learning and well-being. I think for us to take from this. So um, this is, uh, the final sort of bit of the plenary session, then we're going to move into uh, in, at one o'clock, there'll be 
um, two workshops taking place, which um, you will have had the link sent to you in your packs, but also they'll be in the um, also on the chat in Slido. There's two workshops, one on the digital strategy for Wales. And that digital strategy is a, is, 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 is a, is a Welsh government strategy, but there's a session there and looking at how we can incorporate adult learning and, um, and adult education into, into, that, into that strategy and how we can make the most of it and what we've learned from the pandemic. Another one is um, on health and well-being and adult learning, which is obviously a theme of the conference. And I think how we can look at what, what more we can do um, as a sector and as, uh, and as a new government to support well-being for adult learners. Um, hopefully we can look at some of the lessons there again from New Zealand around the well-being budget and how we can translate the well-being of first generations into, into a reality here in Wales. Um, and finally, just reflections from me, I suppose, is I think there's lots, I was really pleased with all the panel discussions and I think there's lots in there from the political panel as well about hopefully raising the status of adult learning and particularly adult community learning um, for uh, after, May, after May's election. I think particularly recognising that there are different routes into learning for individuals. There isn't one type of learner that we need to be focused on. We need to reflect individuals' different experiences and the, and the different points of entry they'll have into the system and how we can support them to learn at their own pace and to fit around their own lives. Um, so I think, you know, and also the reflection on the panel we've had just now is that we are obviously now living in post-Brexit Britain and um, Whatever, whatever people's views on that, I think what we want to make sure is that we don't lose out here in Wales from the links and the collaborations that we have with colleagues in the rest of the UK, also with colleagues in Europe, and I think also as well as we've had Colin here today, colleagues in the rest of the world, and that we try and learn from each other and we try and make sure that though that, that, we, that, we, that we are continuing to collaborate um, as, um, as an organisation, as a country. Um, and finally, just um, last bit of thanks really to my team and in particular to Wendy and to Kay for their huge amount of work that goes into organising these conferences. Um, lots of logistics to go into getting it right and um, massive thank you to both of them, for, in particular to them, for their hard work. Um, and finally, thank, a big thank you to our panellists, our speakers, and to you as delegates for attending today. I hope you will stay and continue and, and join, in the, um, join in the discussions in their workshops at one o'clock. Um, it'd be great to see some of you in there as well. And obviously in the usual way, we'll make sure that the recording is available to everyone so you can see um, and you can re-watch anything you want to pick up on again. But thank you ever so much. Uh, thank you to all the speakers and to all our delegates here this morning. And um, yeah, I hope to see you in the workshops. Thank you.